podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Hi, this is Leo Laporte, and this is my Tech Guy podcast. This show originally aired on the Premier Networks on Sunday, May 23rd, 2021. This is episode 1,799. Enjoy. The Tech Guy podcast is brought to you by Casper. When it comes to a better night's sleep, Casper's new cooling collection has you covered. Focus on tomorrow. Let Casper handle the rest. Explore Casper products, mattresses, sheets, pillows, and more at casper.com slash twit1 and use the code twit1 for $100 off select mattresses. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte, the tech guy here. Time to talk well, computers, yeah. Uh, the internet. <laughs> uh, home. Okay, I'll tell you the whole thing. Home theater, digital photography, smartphones, smartwatches, all that jazz. 88, 88. Ask Leo. I was trying to do something different, something new, but no. I can't. I'm just going to do the same old thing. If it's comp anything but printers, I don't... <laughs> I don't want to hear about your printer problems. 8888, no, you can call with those two. I just won't be able to help you. 8888, ask Leo is the phone number. I don't know why printers are such a problem. All my friends who ever worked in IT used to say, don't, oh, the worst call is the printer, printer call. Oh, oh. 888-827-5536, toll free from anywhere in the U.S. or Canada. Outside that area, you could still call, and it could be a comment, it could be a suggestion, it could be a question. It doesn't have to be a help me. If you if you're outside of the U.S. or Canada, you can Skype. It would probably be the easiest way to do it. Eighty eight eighty eight. Ask Leo. All the answers and all the questions go on the webpage techguylabs.com. Techguylabs.com. We put it there. Make it easy for you. Uh, and there's no charge, there's no sign-up, none of that stuff. So if you hear it, you don't have to write it. James DeRuvo, our scribe, our master scribe, is writing it all for you, so you don't have to. Techguylabs.com um, Let's see, what's going on in the world? Google had a big event, the Google I.O. Developers Conference. I wish I could come here and say to you today, there's some exciting new developments around the corner for Google, but honestly, I can't. Um, you know, they're adding some features to photos. They're going to try to revive the Wear OS watch in the face of pretty stiff competition from the Apple watch. No, Wear OS watches pretty much die. Google stopped pretty much stopped making them. Only a few fashion brands like Fossil continued to, to make them. Now Google says, we're going to work with Samsung. And uh, Samsung is giving up on its smartwatches based on the Tizen operating system, something Samsung wrote itself because he didn't want to be beholden to Google. Then it turned out <laughs> there's no market for smartwatches outside of Apple Watch and Fitbit. And, of course, Google bought Fitbit. So now it's going to really be a two-horse race. And mostly the horse is going to be is going to be the one named Apple Computer. Uh, so there you there you have it. Really, Google showed what else did they do? They said, "Well, we're going to make Wear watches with a Samsung. It's going to be cool." Oh, they showed the new Android uh, 12, which won't be out till the fall. It's pretty new design. That's about it. It's nothing. They, they put out, uh, they showed and demonstrated something called Lambda, L-A-M-D-A, our breakthrough conversation technology, they called it. Except that it's only in the lab. Their demonstration was of a conversation between a human and a computer pretending to be Pluto. And then after that, a paper airplane. And you were to be impressed, very impressed with how uh, fluid and fluent... The computer was almost as if it were a real planet instead of just a frozen rock. Uh, almost as if it were a real paper airplane. Uh, but it's, you know, they didn't really give you a lot of details. <laughs> it's very likely they generated a bunch of conversations and picked the one that sounded the most human. So our breakthrough conversation technology from Google. Yeah, okay. You know what? 
Google might, I think Google has just finally broken down and admitted it. We're not a technology company. We're, we do search and advertising, and we're good at it. And we make billions of dollars a year at it. And so we're just going to do that. <laughs> and the heck with the rest of you. Now, Microsoft has its chance. This week is their build conference. But the one everybody's kind of waiting for is in two weeks, January, uh, sorry, June 7th to 15 days from now. Apple's Worldwide Developer Conferences. They all have them all at the same time, don't they? Apple's will have almost certainly some product announcements. Yeah, because that's that's Apple. They've been, they've been running on all 23 cylinders of late. Google's been taking a nap. It took basically took, uh, took uh, 2020 off, which I think many of us wish we had. Took 2020 off, and it still hasn't really quite quite woken up. Microsoft has, uh, well, they are also, you know, they're sitting back a little bit. They were they were working on this thing called Windows 10X. They've announced, yeah, we're not going to do that. They they had this really cool, I thought, dual screen phone, the Microsoft Duo. You can buy it at half price right now, which tells me it may be not selling that well. At fifteen hundred dollars, that's a that was expensive. Seven hundred bucks. It's uh, less expensive, but just as undesirable. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, the, really the tech industry has not, 2020 has been really about just selling, getting as many computers out as they could, given the chip shortages and the high demand from COVID. And well, that's about it. Meanwhile, Apple put out uh, Macintoshes in seven colors. <laughs> and the, and the, ru the uh, reviews are out this week. For the new iMac, the colorful iMacs, the 24-inch iMacs, and people are loving them, loving them. So I suspect we're going to see more uh, computer hardware from Apple, probably a couple of laptops in, a, in 15 days. Meanwhile, Apple's uh, spending time on the, on the witness stand in the Apple versus Epic battle, and it is Epic. Uh, this is the battle. Epic is a, a game company. They do something called Fortnite that probably everybody's aware of. They didn't want to give Apple 30% of all Fortnite sales, so they pulled it off the App Store. <clears throat> that didn't go so well. Then Apple, when they when they pulled uh, Fortnite, actually, they didn't, it was a little different. What they did, knowing that they would get pulled off the App Store, is they changed the, the payment system in their game Fortnite, which is against the rules for Apple. Apple yanked them. See, for Epic wanted them to do that. That way, Apple would look like the bad guy. Uh, and then Epic sued them, and now they're in court, and the testimony's been going on this week. Tim Cook, Apple's CEO, kind of wrapped up the case for Apple by saying, <clears throat> I, I don't recall. <laughs> it's always a good thing to do when you're on the witness stand to say, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> for instance... Um, Epic has said, um, how much investment do you put in? How much do you spend uh, on the uh, App Store? And Tim Cook said, well, we do uh, 15 to $20 billion a year in research and development, R&D. But I couldn't, I couldn't really tell you how much of that is, uh, goes to the App Store. What? <laughs> like, I really wouldn't know. We don't allocate it like that. Well, of course they do. They know exactly how much. But Tim is very, I think, very studiously, whenever they're at the board meeting, puts his fingers in his ears, goes, no, 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 I can't hear you. I don't want to know because I'm going to be testifying. <laughs> I don't want to know. Uh, okay. So it's, uh, you know what? They're battening down the hatches in big tech right now because they know, they know the steely eye of government is pointing their direction and they're a little nervous about all of that and i and i actually don't blame them so they're just they're just trying to keep their heads down meanwhile amazon has built you, you ever get the ring video doorbell i had them uh all over the country now and uh, it, uh lauren bridges writing in the guardian amazon's ring is the largest civilian surveillance network the U.S. has ever seen. One in ten police departments in the country can access videos from the Ring doorbell. Millions of rings are out there. Amazon has 1,800 partnerships with local law enforcement agencies. Now, 
I should be clear, because the law enforcement agency can request video that was captured by the doorbell. Your doorbell's pointing out of the street. Sometimes that's useful. But you don't have to give it to them. They don't need a warrant, but they do have to request it, and you can say no. But most people, I think, say, yeah, sure. Catch that bad guy, right? Why wouldn't they? But now, uh, the problem is, your neighbor has a camera pointed at your house in many cases. If you have an across-the-street neighbor with a ring doorbell, your neighbor is pointing that camera at your house. He gets to say whether the police get that video, not you. And you're on it. Your house is on it. So it's, it's kind of what's happened with ring is uh, law enforcement has, has kind of said, hey, look, we got a great camera network out there. But, you know, I watch, I watch cop shows. It, they all, first place they go, they go to the 7-Eleven. They say, let me have the tapes. Was your camera pointing out the window across the street? That's, you know, I'm not sure I'm against it, but just something to be aware of. You might want to go look around your neighborhood and see who has one of them. Maybe you do. Of course, that's the difference. If you have it, then you're the one giving permission. Los Angeles Times says the uh, California Department of Motor Vehicles is investigating whether Tesla violates state law by, by saying, by advertising that they have full self-driving capability. They don't. They don't. Um, and the DMV's you know, in fine print, it says on the website, full self-driving, quote, does not make the car autonomous and, quote, apt active supervision is required by the driver. But there's plenty of people, some quite well known, who are driving their Teslas from the back seat. And, of course, there was a famous crash not so long ago. Last week, a man was arrested by the California Highway Patrol and charged with reckless driving. He was sitting in the back seat while his Tesla drove over the Bay Bridge between Oakland and San Francisco. <laughs> he went to court. I don't know if he paid his fine. I'm not sure what happened in court. They took his car. They impounded it. While he was in court, he had another Tesla delivered and drove it home in the back seat. Oh, boy, don't do that. Don't do that. So uh, LA Times quotes a, a professor of law saying, Tesla seems to be asking for legal trouble on many fronts from the FTC and its state counterparts for deceptive marketing, for the California Department of Motor Vehicles for potentially crossing into the realm of autonomous vehicle testing without state approval, from competitors with driver assistance systems, competitors with actual automated driving systems, ordinary consumers, and future crash victims who could sue under state or federal law. Ooh. The great Astrid Gilberto. Buzz, buzz. That sounds that's, about right. That's your song, man. Busy signal. Busy, You're busy. getting a busy signal right now. I there, can guarantee it. <laughs> there are two different busy signals you can get when you call us. There's the line is busy, and then there's a trunk is busy because... It's if so out. many people call, it's so many people call you. The trunk can only handle so many. So a fast oh. busy means it's really jammed. Well, that's probably what they get uh, when the phone lines just aren't open, right? I don't know what they get. <laughs> I don't either. I think they get a recording from you saying, "Hi, this you know is Kim Schaffer. I don't answer the phone. The unbreakable until... <laughs> phone angel. I'm not here right now. Yes, I'm not. Please here don't leave week. a message. We no. don't have an answering machine. <laughs> who does? Who does? <laughs> These days, who does? So Kim is our phone angel. She's where? Did you, did you break out of San Quentin uh, <laughs> earlier today? Because that shh, shh, looks like you got secret. you got stripes. <laughs> you got stripes. Uh, who should I? Uh, who should I talk to? Uh, we have no printer qu questions. Yet, Thank so you. That's good. Um, Thank you. Yeah, Jim and Big Bear wants to alert you to some new Roku. Uh, we ended something. the show yesterday with the longest printer question of I all know. time. <laughs> Like, it ended on a sour note I am note never for going you. home, am I? I'm I believe to, you did this. Uh, I, I, I did a, a gesture. Yes, not to the caller. No, it wasn't that gesture. It was either. the shoot me gesture. I've had enough printer calls for the day, and yes. I went home and I took a nap, actually. I couldn't take Too it. Too much for your brain. I could not take it. Jim and Big Bear. Thank you, Kim. You're Leo welcome. Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Jim. How are you doing, Leo? I'm well. How are you? Uh, okay, so we're up here at 7,000 feet. Nice sunny day, a little brisk. Oh, it's so beautiful. I know where Big Bear is. Beautiful. Yeah, so, well, I just had a topic to bring up. 
Yes. You probably have some listeners who are experiencing this. Um, Wednesday, Roku had an issue where a subset of users suddenly lost the ability to use their volume controls and power button on their remote. No, really? It doesn't line up with their updates. Uh, the update that I had had been out for a little over two weeks. It just happened. And uh, all of a sudden, Wednesday afternoon, uh, the buttons weren't working. And I went through all their suggested fixes on their page for you know, resetting. And I just bought that new uh, rechargeable remote, which is great because my three-year-old Roku does not have a mute button on the original remote. Right. So uh, having that mute was really cool. And it all stopped working. Now it's so permanently it's muted. <laughs> yeah, it's permanently not working. So um, can you turn the TV um, up otherwise? Oh yeah, with with the harmony. Okay. Um, so yeah, it, yeah, got but a harmony. And the, the original Pro remote doesn't have a mute, but no, those buttons had stopped working. Yeah. Uh, so Thursday night they pushed out an incremental update. Uh, they'd pushed out a version ten uh, earlier in May, and. I had a little quirk with it, had to do a reset, uh, but uh, everything was working until Wednesday. So if you look on community.roku.com on the sidebar, there's a thread that was started by one of the Roku engineers. That, Did you recently lose access to your volume? Wow. And um, there's about 10 screens, almost 100 people who have responded. I think I've been on there three times. Wow. The engineers the engineers did send me a private message and I wasn't aware of it. They wanted to try to take me back to the last version nine to see if it comes back and bring me back up. But I haven't heard from them since. So they did fix it or no, 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 the patch actually made it worse. Now I have to turn on the Roku before the monitor or the Roku becomes unstable until I cycle power on the monitor. It's really crazy, and the Harmony puts the remote or the Roku in last. Yikes! Well, so I guess if this is happening to you, keep an eye on the Roku blog. What? Well, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. So they didn't even fix it. They pushed an update, but it didn't fix it. No, it actually made the Roku more unstable. <laughs> and it's weird that it happened without an update. Sometimes, you know, companies do. Uh, Secret updates. They don't, you know, they're pushing stuff yeah, there, out. They must have. There was no, yeah, there's a build number underneath the version. And I was on 4195 or 4196. And it had been on there for weeks. And all of a sudden, it just, it no volume. A lot of people lost it. I saw one person post an interesting thread topic, which was they were probably cleaning out their database of known devices oh. and cleaned out a lot of older older units is there smart TVs and receivers that people are re are talking about their TVs don't work their receivers don't work but um, I figured if enough people got in there and started complaining they might figure out what they did and fix it but interesting, interesting. Yeah, so this is me. this is a a feature a uh, kind of a, a universal remote feature because it's not changing anything on the Roku it's actually changing your TV. It's, it's actually doing the infrared on the TV. Yeah. So what happens is for some, yeah, I think your theory is interesting that it, uh, maybe they took that TV. Is it an older TV? It's an older AV receiver. It's an older Sony. Old, older. Years old. So maybe they took it out of the database. Yeah. That, that's the thought. Yeah. That makes so, sense. Um, yeah. So I have a feeling they're very they're too busy to answer right now. But I just thought if enough people got in there and and uh, made their voice known, because I just bought that that you know that uh, rechargeable remote. It's frustrating, it Jim. Yeah. yeah, suddenly it doesn't work. It's, it's frustrating. Very basic. Back to the harmony, which is also <laughs> which is going to start stop working too. <laughs> hey, thank you for calling and let everybody know. I appreciate it, Jim. All right, Leo. Have a good day. Have a good day. Take care. Hey, we'll be back with more of the Tech Guy Show in just a moment. But first, a word from my mattress, Casper. Love your tomorrows with Casper. And man, now that it's starting to heat up, you'll be glad you have the new Casper Cooling Collection. Everything you need to help you sleep all night long. Casper's mattresses come with the new snow technology. 
There's also their hyperlight sheets, their lightweight duvets, their breathable mattress protectors, all designed to keep you cool and comfortable so you can't help but love your tomorrow. Tomorrow's a new day. Make the most of it with Casper's new cooling collection, like their new Wave Hybrid Snow Mattress. <laughs> it sounds chilly, but it actually it keeps you refreshingly cool. You know that feeling when you flip your pillow over and it's nice and cool or you stick your toes into a, a new corner of their sheets and it's nice and cool? That's what I'm talking about. And the snow mattress keeps you cool for 12 plus hours, literally pulling heat away from your body for sustained temperature regulation, a cool to touch feeling and a much improved tomorrow. Research shows sleeping cooler is a better night's sleep. Better bedding means for a better tomorrow. That's why Casper's Hyperlite sheets are designed with an innovative grid weave that lets the air flow through for maximum breathability. And the lightweight duvet is still plush, it's still comfy, but it also provides optimal temperature control. And don't forget the Casper breathable mattress protector. It improves the coolness of your bed even further by allowing air to flow between your body and the mattress. Most mattress protectors seal heat in, not the Casper breathable mattress protector. They're all designed to work together to prevent overheating all night long because cooler sleep means better sleep, and better sleep means better tomorrows. We love our Casper mattress. We just got a new one. I've, I think I've owned every Casper mattress, and, and I've given Casper mattresses to many family members. My, my sister-in-law has one. My my daughter just got one when she moved to her new apartment. I set her up Casper frame, a Casper foundation, Casper mattress, even got her the sheets and the pillows. She loves it. My son's always had Casper mattresses too. Uh, I'm just a big Casper fan, and it's so easy to send. It makes a great gift. They come in an easy box. When uh, Henry went off to college, he said, this mattress is funky in the dorm. I said, Henry, I'll send you a Casper. Casper always offers free shipping and free returns. When it comes to a better night's sleep, Casper's new cooling collection has you covered. So focus on tomorrow. Let Casper handle the rest. Explore Casper products with mattresses, sheets, pillows, and more at casper.com slash twit1. And don't forget to use the code twit1, T-W-I-T, and the number one for $100 off select mattresses. That's the code TWIT and the number one, TWIT1, for $100 off select mattresses at casper.com slash TWIT1. Exclusions apply. See casper.com for more details. Somebody sent me an email saying, but which mattresses? And I said, see casper.com for more details. <laughs> casper.com slash TWIT1. And don't forget the offer code TWIT1. Thank you, Casper, for supporting the Tech Guy podcast. Thank you, podcast listeners, for supporting us by using that address and that offer code. It helps. It really does. Casper.com slash TWIT1. Now, back to the show. It's time for the car guy, Sam Abul Samet. He is principal researcher at Guidehouse Insights. He's also a podcaster himself at Wheel Bearings. That's his podcast at wheelbearings.media. And he joined with Roberto Baldwin, the great Roberto Baldwin. He joins us every week to talk about cars from beautiful Ypsilanti, Michigan. Wednesday night, Ford announced its electric F-150 truck. Boy, if this takes off, it could be the beginning of really a revolution in electric vehicles, I think. But it's not the only I electric truck, is it, Sam? No, there's there's a whole slew of electric trucks coming to market, um, including you know, obviously I think everybody's heard about the Cybertruck, which was you know that was actually introduced uh, just a couple of days after the the Mach E was originally revealed. Crazy in Los looking Angeles. battle vehicle straight out of Mad Max. Yeah, and uh, during some comments from uh, people at Ford, you know, they said you know their their customers are are not interested in a giant doorstop, uh, which is why they're. Why, why, they're, why the why the F one fifty Lightning, which is the electric version of the F one fifty, is you know it's a truck shaped truck that does truck stuff. Um, and you know, apparently, uh, it looks like it's going to be a pretty good truck. Actually, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's got a lot of capabilities. Um, you know, for for Ford, you know, the, the big thing for Ford is a lot of their truck customers are commercial customers, right? Uh, you know, that's a huge part of Ford's overall business is the commercial market. In fact, Ford. 
um, Ford has 43% market share in commercial trucks and vans. So between the, the transit vans and the F-Series pickups, you know, they have nearly half of the market in the U.S. Wow. And so they really see that as a key segment, especially for the electric trucks, because uh, those users, those customers, often rack up a lot more miles than the average consumer. You know, most people drive about twelve to 15,000 miles a year. Commercial truck owners can accumulate fifty to 100,000 miles a year easily. And when you think about you know, how much more fuel the gas-powered versions of those trucks use, the potential savings in operating costs are enormous for a commercial customer. And so they're, those are the ones that are really going after with this vehicle. So it's got a lot of features that are targeted to them. Uh, you know, whereas some of the other trucks on, that are coming onto the market, like the Cybertruck, um, the, the Rivian R1T, which is another one that I think is also going to do really well, uh, you know, and uh, the GMC Hummer EV that uh, is coming later this year as well. You know, those are all targeted more at consumers, you know, and uh, they're, they're lifestyle vehicles, you know, adventure vehicles. Um, particularly the the Rivian, uh, you know, which is actually quite a bit smaller than an F-150. It's actually closer in size to the Ford Ranger, which is a mid-size truck rather than the full-size uh, F-150. Uh, but I think you know I think the Rivian is going to do really well because uh, it's it also has a lot of interesting features. But the Lightning, uh, you know, it's based on the same it's the same size as a standard gas F-150 crew cab. Uh, but it has a completely unique frame that they developed because uh, trucks, you know, these trucks are all body on frame. Uh, so they developed a unique version of the frame for the electric truck to support the, the battery packs. Uh, and then it's got independent rear suspension, which no F-Series truck has ever had before. Uh, and so you end up with this flat skateboard like you see with a lot of these other uh, EVs, modern EVs. And then the body is put on top of that. The exterior skin of the F-150 Lightning is is unique to the electric version because it's a little more aerodynamic, a little slicker. But underneath the structure of the body is all the same. It has the same mounting points to the frame. So, again, for commercial customers, one of the keys for those buyers, and also for you know for some consumers, is you know they put a lot of extra gear. They buy their trucks and they put other gear on there. You know, like. Car, you know, winches carpenters and, and electricians and yeah, plumbers. Yeah. yeah, they'll put winches on. They'll you know they'll have racks for tools and parts mm -hmm, and things mm -hmm. on the back. And uh, you know, for a commercial user, they'll often go you know every couple of years, every two, three, four years, they'll replace their trucks and they'll just take that stuff off of one truck, put it on the new one. Oh, so you and, have to you know, be so compatible. Oh, want it to be compatible. So that's the the bed of, of the the Lightning is exactly the same as a standard gas F one fifty. Um, and so those are those are important considerations for those customers. But for even for consumers, there's a lot of interesting features in here. Like for example, the frunk. You know, this is something. There's that no Tesla engine in that front. Here. That big big gap in the front. There's nothing in there. <laughs> right. But but now you have a 14 cubic foot wow. storage space in there. Yeah. Uh, That's where you put the stuff you don't want anybody to get to. The secret exactly. Stuff, you can lock it all up and, in there. It's out yeah, of sight, out of yeah. mind. And and you know the the base of the frunk you know, has uh, can support up to 400 pounds. So they were showing an example. You know, you can put eight bags of Quickcrete cement oh, in nice. there, you know, <laughs> keep, keep them dry. And you know, the, wow. what would traditionally wow. be the grill is actually attached to the hood and it's powered. And it, Ford calls it the Mega Power Frunk. Uh, so you know, it lifts up. Stealing, and, you know, stealing a page from Elon Musk, I think. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and Make so it opens frunk. all the way down to the bumper. You know, which is you know, it makes it a little more manageable to load stuff in yeah. and out. Yeah. Yeah. That quick and, creek can really be hard to get off the ground, so it's oh, good. Oh yeah. 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 And inside the frunk, there are four 120 volt outlets in there. Wow. And, For all your tools. Um, so that, your power yeah, tools. Yeah, the, the, uh, the Lightning um, has Ford's uh, Pro Power on board system, which they launched uh, last year on the new hybrid. Uh, so the base version gets 2.4 kilowatts of power. So you've got a couple of outlets in the in the bed, a couple of outlets in the cab, That's and four nice. in the frunk. That's and nice. And then the, the optional version is 9.6 kilowatts. And they showed a demo. I, I, got, I went out to the Ford Proving Grounds the week before the reveal. Um, and got some demo rides in these things off road and high speed, uh, and so you know with this you know again commercial customers often use you know they often carry along a generator to power sure. tools on a job yeah. site. You don't need it now. They can power can, right off the battery. Got a big old battery in there. 
Yeah, so, they, they had a, a cement mixer, um, a, <laughs> wow. an air compressor, a miter saw, a bunch of shop lights, and a whole bunch of other tools oh, all running at the same time. It makes me want to build a house or something. <laughs> yeah. That's really exactly. awesome. It's really like kind of a kind of super duper utility vehicle. So uh, what was the reception like? Did they take pre-orders? Yeah, they started taking pre-orders on Wednesday night, uh, right? You know, as they were doing the live reveal on uh, online on YouTube, mm -hmm. uh, they did, they had a big event at the Ford headquarters. Elon Musk, had, Tesla has really inspired a lot of this, haven't they? I mean, oh yeah, everybody's very doing much so. what Elon did. Particularly for Ford, they yeah. you know they have really they've tried to copy all the best elements of the yeah. Tesla playbook in terms of promotion. And uh, Jim Farley tweeted out uh, a couple of days later that they got 45,000 pre-orders in the first 48 hours. Um, How many? So 45,000. Wow. Now, they, yeah. were, they were only $100 pre-orders, right? So yeah. it's not a huge commitment, but... No, and it's it's refundable. And you know, in the case of Tesla, you know, with the the pre-orders, you know, they've been doing the pre-orders for a long time. Typically, you know, Tesla has had uh, an average about a thirty percent conversion rate on pre-orders to actual purchases. Um, you know, in in this case here, uh, you know, I think you know it, it may be similar or or maybe a little bit more. We we'll 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 have to see. Uh, but I think you know again because a lot of the customers are going to be commercial customers. They're not going to be going through that pre-order process. They'll be going through their the fleet their sales. fleet yeah uh, fleet yeah. sales yeah. Um, uh, representatives. So it might in fact be a lot more even. I, I would 45, I would 000. not be at all surprised yeah. if it's a lot more than that. Yeah. Is uh, Ford going to, now they had to actually shut down the, the gasoline F-150 line because they ran out of chips. Are they going to have yeah. uh, supply issues with this too? Um, that depends on, on when the, the whole chip shortage situation gets sorted out. Um, you know, they have had to cut shifts and, and cut production on the, the regular F-150 as they have with most of their yeah. vehicles over the last several months. As has everybody um, else. Yeah. But but the, uh, the Lightning uh, won't be out. Uh, production starts next spring, so it'll be available about a year from now. Okay. Uh, so maybe things will be plant that they built. up by then. Where are they going to build it? Yeah. Not in Dearborn? Uh, no, it is going to be built in Dearborn. They built a new facility right next door to the existing Rouge assembly plant where they build nice. F-150s today. Nice. That is dedicated just for the electric trucks. Wow. This is a big bet. Ford is really, and I guess everybody else is doing it. Everybody but, is. Yeah. yeah. But Ford's really going in on, uh, on that. I'm... I'm thrilled to see it. This looks like a great uh, product from Ford. Thank you, Sam. Principal welcome, researcher Will. at Guidehouse Insights, wheelbearings.media for his podcast, Sam Abu Salmon. Nice. Man, I wish I had an excuse to buy it. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't mention the price, but it's actually uh, f fairly reasonably priced as well, right? Yeah, it star starts at $40,000. Um, what, what does a gas F-150 start at? Uh, not, so it, not much less. You can, right? you can get you can get a base uh, standard bed uh, standard cab V6 uh, F150 starting at about twenty eight thousand. Oh, okay. But um, the the Lightning is standard with dual motor four wheel drive, um, and it's a and it's a crew cab only right now. So if you compare that's the right, you XL, get the crew which cab is the, too, the yeah. base trim yeah. uh, in in four wheel drive crew cab. That's actually forty two five, so it's cheaper Great. base price. Wow! And you get the the discounts on it wow. for for being electric. The crew cab means I could probably just use it as my family car. You can. Some yeah. people do. And build a house every once in a while. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Pull over and bring out the yeah. bring out Stash the power all your stuff in the front and, and yeah, in the bed. Yeah, yeah. And, I think I'm going to build something here. That's yeah. oh, I want one so bad. It's so cool. You can so you can cool. tow ten thousand pounds with it. Yeah, well, that's what I told Lisa. I said we could we could put an RV, a trailer on this thing. I get my finally get my um, uh, my trailer. What is that? Uh, the silver bullet the airstream. Yeah, I want finally get my airstream. Put it on there. Oh man, It'd be so fun. She says you're doing it by yourself, buddy boy. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you want me to stick around for the the top of the hour to answer questions? Uh, off oh the, yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. You want to do that? Only sure. if you have time. People no, love I'm not going uh, anywhere. doing this. I'm, so, I'm waiting for the battery to recharge for my lawnmower so I can finish mowing the lawn. So, <laughs> Damn electric lawnmowers. So <laughs> uh, what, we, um, what we do with uh, Scott, and I'd love to do it with you, is he does, I give him the next two breaks. So I give okay. you a little, um, I'll give you a little um, special Sam window here like that and that has the clock in it 
and then you can just uh, take questions from the chat or the Discord as you as you wish. If you want to do that, yeah, that's great. If you'd if you'd like to do that, that'd be fun. And yeah, so he you, you know you only get a couple minutes here, but then uh, then you'll get about seven minutes uh, at the top of the hour. So it's All a right. little extra content from Sam. I appreciate it. You don't have to do that every time, but anytime you're <laughs> charging your power mower, you can uh, you can stick around. <laughs> yeah. It'd be great. Yeah, yeah. I'm ex I'm excited. I think there's a lot of people excited by this uh, F-150, which is great. It's really going to help. <laughs> CNET says the uh, the frunk is actually one cube larger than the trunk of the Toro Toyota Corolla sedan. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's like 13, 12 to 13 cubic feet is typical for a small to mid-sized sedan for the trunk. And this is 14. That's so great. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And and it's got those four outlets in there to plug all I your stuff. I love in. that, man. Yeah. It also has the, the lower cavity there with the drain plug in so and a partition so you can put your wet stuff in there and let that drain down. I'm thinking we put a podcast studio in the back. I could drive around and do shows. Yeah. Stick get a get a Starlink uh satellite dish and put it on the roof. Yep. Bed. Yep. Yep. Just got, and then you just have to make sure you find a place with no trees around. Yeah, I know. Can you believe that? <laughs> Did you read Neil I. Patel's? Yes, uh, of review? course. It's hysterical. Yeah, it seems a little sensitive. Although, um, I, I think I'm starting to hear from people saying, you know, now that there are more, as every time they put up more satellites, it gets better in that regard. Yeah, it should. You know, as yeah, you get, as you get a broader coverage, right. you know, uh, especially right. in the northern areas. So, yeah, this is the early days. Uh, okay. Let's, uh, I'm going to go back to work. You'll stick around. Yep. Thank you, I'll sir. I'll just go on mute for now. Okay. Thanks. You don't have to do that. I do it. I have a button right here. Kim's shirt is the white stripes. That's hysterical. Some might say it's black stripes. Really? I. <laughs> Leo Laporte, the tech guy. 8888. Ask Leo. Uh, Suzanne on the line from Anaheim, California is our next caller. Hi, Suzanne. Hi, Leo. Hello. Thank you for taking my call. Thanks for calling. Well, you've helped me a lot in the last couple of years. I'm the one that went camping in the Urals, and you helped me keep my cell phone powered up. Wow. Did it work? It did. Yay. Yay. So that was, that was wonderful. But what I have a question about today is I am about to retire from uh, from teaching. I've spent 30 years teaching science in the classroom. Oh, congratulations. That's wonderful. Thank you. But I have to turn in my district-issued laptop, and I need a replacement for personal use. Yes, and you can get a much better one than the district gave you, I'm sure. Absolutely. <laughs> and I don't want a Chromebook. No. And do you, now, it sounds like you probably want Windows, I'm going to guess. Cause, yes. Yeah, that's what you've been using. Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. No interest in Mac at all? No. No. I'm, I've always used Windows, and um, what I want to do with it is just personal email, but I am a field biologist by oh, training, neat. science teacher by trade, and once I retire, I'm going to be out and about uh, bird Dose, watching. Docenting and things. So, yeah. So, so I take notes. And then transcribe them and look up lists of things and, you know, side by side windows kind of a thing. There's and I was looking for some recommendations. Is there any specialized software that you need for this or is it just basic stuff? It's just basic stuff. Okay. Okay. Um, and how about, is battery life important to you? It sounds like it um, might be if you're out in the field. If I'm out in the field... Uh, yes, but at home, I usually keep it uh, plugged in, if not uh, very close to the plug, and to, to recharge the battery that way. So uh, domestic travel, yes. In fact, I, I'm looking at F-150s. <laughs> yeah. Get a little trailer, drive around, go to all the yeah. bird parks in the country. It'd be amazing. <laughs> yeah. Sounds like well, that fun. Was, that was interesting to hear Sam talk about the new F-150s, but I need a laptop first. Well, you can. the good news is you can plug in the laptop once you get the F-150. So, Absolutely. So, uh, 
and port. It sounds like portability. How high a priority is that to you? So what? Um, what, what we ask these questions because in the PC, in, if it were a Mac, it, there really aren't that many choices. There's a handful, but in the PC world, there's almost it seems an infinite number of choices, and there's trade offs in in everything. So. Uh, you know, if if you want it thin and light, that's one thing. If you want extra battery life, that's another thing. If you're gonna, if you want a big screen, that's another thing. So, how important is portability? Uh, somewhat. Um, uh, this, I have a, a case, big case to put it in. I get to keep the case that the district laptop came in, and so I was looking at one that was perhaps 17 inches. Um, so I know that's a little heavier. That's but, huge. Uh, yeah. Well, there are only a handful of companies that still make 17 inch laptops. And I'll tell you that the, besides the weight, the, uh, the, the disadvantage is battery life can be minutes, not hours. So, uh, -huh. uh because you're driving that big old screen, these are called desktop replacements. And that yes. means they have most of the, much of the power of a desktop, um, but they also, you know, are, are bulky and that poor battery life. But there are some very good ones. I think I'm going to point you to, so they're, the big three manufacturers are HP, Dell, and Lenovo. Okay. Uh, of course, there are many, many others, but those are the big three. All three of them make excellent laptops. I would not argue against any of them, but for, uh, if you don't, the, the styling of the Lenovo's is not as, slick but they are built tough okay. and I, so i'm a kind of a fan of the lenovo think pads now not all the lenovos but just the think pad line and there is there are 17 inch think pads um battery life not going to be great uh -huh. as i mentioned but you're going to get a big screen and the nice thing about lenovo uh the way they s sell these is you kind of choose what line what model you want and then you can configure your heart, your heart out. You're probably going to want to, if you're going to want 17, uh, you're probably going to want to start with one of their mobile workstations, like the P17. They start about okay. 1,500 bucks. I didn't ask you about uh, budget. I, according to my husband, I have an unlimited budget unless I exceed it. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I like your husband. <laughs> the other, so uh, the the P the P seventeen is a seventeen inch mobile workstation. It is a workhorse. You know, it's very powerful. Uh, it can have uh, dedicated graphics if you want. Lots of storage, very fast storage, lots of memory. Starts at fifteen hundred bucks. Okay. Um, they have a Memorial Day sale going on, but you know the thing. Don't be fooled. Lenovo always quotes this huge number as their list price, and then they've got coupon codes pretty much all year round to bring it down to about half that price. Mm -hmm. So uh, you'll see it when you go to Lenovo's site. I think the P17 is going to be a good choice for you because it's it's built. It's a workhorse. It's a 17 inch. It's built to last. Uh, Lenovo's, uh, especially with the P series, uh -huh. um, are very repairable. You can, if the keyboard breaks, you can replace it. If the screen breaks, you can replace it. That's one of the things I like about these. Um, I think this will be a good one for the field. It's going to be heavy again, but you understand okay. that. Yep. But it's going to be a nice big screen that you're going to really like. You can get, Lenovo offers what they call WAN cards that are basically cellular modems. So that oh. you can, you can if you're out in the field bird watching, if you can get, uh, uh, your carrier can can be received, you'll be able to get data, which is even nicer. Uh -huh. Really like that. Oh, that would be great. Yeah. Uh, All right. Yeah. Well, this this definitely helps point me in the right direction. I like these. I, I buy. In fact, I'm I'm going to hold up, even though it's on the radio. I'm going to hold up my ThinkPad. I buy a lot of these Lenovo's because I really think they're strong, robust, uh, bulletproof machines. But get the ThinkPad. The lower end Lenovo's, like the IdeaPad, are not quite as robust. But this is absolutely robust. Oh right. Well, that's that sounds like what I'm looking for. My binoculars have always been robust and yeah. take a beating in the field. Mill and, spec. Yeah. So my with the binocs and the and the laptop, I will be set and ready to go. I I could you know I don't I don't know how I knew, but I could just tell that you were that kind of person. You're gonna you want the best quality. You don't mind a little extra weight. You want good good binocs. You got you probably do you bring a hand lens and a pickaxe with you as well. 
Yes, I do have a hand lens in my field bag. <laughs> okay, okay. My dad is a geologist. Always used to have a little pick, a little mm -hmm. field, a little hand lens with him at all times. Mm -hmm. and if, and if looking, you, looking at everything when I'm out there. Exactly. So, I, exactly. I bet your students loved you. I'm sure they're going to be sad to lose you. They, they, we haven't been able to do labs uh, for the last... Oh year and a half and this year has been tough trying to do it all virtually oh, and I bet. um but with the anonymity of the zoom um there's kids i've never seen and i i missed that isn't that sad what grade did you teach uh, i taught high school 9 high through school. 12 9 through 12 and what's what kind of science uh earth science and biology nice so um, in my travels i've been able to bring not just um good stories but specimens and things to look at and put in their hands and haven't been able to do that and yeah. rocks and flowers oh. and all kinds of stuff like that i'm sorry that's but thank you for 30 years of service that's oh well, thank you the, leo and those, thank the, you for always being there you've been a big help in our in. my tech guy has always been impressed by when i come back and say hey did you hear what <laughs> leo said i need a p17 honey <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Enjoy. Enjoy your retirement, Suzanne. That's great. Nice to talk Thank to you. Thank you very much, Leo. And we'll call you back again if anything else comes I'm always up. here for you. I appreciate that. Every weekend, you are. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you. <laughs> oh, I love teachers. I do. I do. Uh, and now, ladies and gentlemen, for the first time ever... I give you Sam Abu Samad's special car show. I'm so glad we have this. Thank you for doing this. I appreciate it. Questions well, you for You mentioned Sam. it a few weeks ago, and yeah. I know a couple of people asked about it in the chat. Oh, so people love out. you. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Any questions for Sam, you can do it in the Discord, uh, in the Tech Guy section, or you can do it in our IRC. And I'm going to get up and go get something to eat. So it's all yours, all my right. friend. So um, just to, to follow up on a question that uh, Dr. Mom Grandma had in the chat, um, and in case you're, you're not following that, <clears throat> uh, she asked about uh, a NEMA plug in the, uh, the F-150 Lightning. And um, both the, the current hybrid version of the F-150 that launched uh, last fall and the, uh, the new electric version, um, actually even the, the regular gas versions, now offer something called Pro Power on board, which is Ford's uh, essentially you know, uh, a generator system. So you don't have to drag along a generator, uh, a gas generator with you if you want power uh, somewhere, either at a campsite or at a job site, whatever it might be. The base version that they have, the standard version that's available on the, the hybrid uh, and also on the, the electric uh, truck uh, provides 2.4 kilowatts of power. On the hybrid, uh, with that base version, you get four uh, 120 volt outlets in the bed of the truck. And then um, on the electric, you get four 120 volt outlets in the front, another two in the cab, and two more in the bed. Then the upgraded version of that for the electric uh, gets you to 9.6 kilowatt hours. On the hybrid, it's 7.2 kilowatts uh, available. And that adds in a couple more 120 volt outlets plus a 240 volt NEMA outlet. So if you need to take along your, your welding rig um, or any other tools that require 240 volts, you can bring along your dryer, uh, plug that in. You can plug those right in into the outlet in the bed of the truck and you're good to go. Um, let's see. Uh, from Redacted, can an individual uh, buy from the fleet services sales rep? Any tips? Uh, Redacted, I do not know the answer to that question. Um, I will have to check. Um, my guess is probably not. Uh, you probably have to go through your regular dealer. And I'm not sure that, you know, for, for an individual, I'm not sure there's really any advantage of going through fleet sales um, unless you're a commercial customer. I mean, if, you're, if you have a small business and you just need one or two trucks, you can go through fleet sales, through their commercial vehicle sales, uh, and buy it that way. Um, is the weight from Bob 12 Dozen, is the, uh, is the weight distribution different for an electric versus standard truck and how it might handle in winter? Um, actually, they, they have, Ford hasn't released the specifics and no other uh, automaker has either for their electric trucks. But I would say the answer to that question is almost certainly uh, yes, that it is going to be different from a conventional truck. You know, if you think about a conventional truck, a lot of the weight is in the, the front where you've got the engine and the transmission. And if the bed's empty, if you're not carrying anything, there's usually very little weight over the, um, over the rear axle. 
and those can be a real handful to drive in the wintertime because um, you don't have as much traction available. The, um, with these electric trucks, because you're going to have a big battery that's located you know, in the base of the truck, in the frame of the truck, it's usually going to be spread out, you know, taking up in the case of the, the extended range battery in the F-150 and, and also for, uh, for most of the other trucks, it's going to take up most of that space so that most of the weight is actually going to be distributed much more evenly across the truck. So you're going to have, um, much, you're going to have considerably more weight on the rear axle uh, even when you don't have anything in the bed. Uh, so it should be a lot easier to drive in the wintertime. And in the case of the F-150, dual motor four-wheel drive is standard. There's no, for now at least, there's no rear-wheel drive version. Um, so it'll be, uh, it'll be four-wheel drive. Uh, if you get the standard range battery, it's 426 horsepower and 775 pounds-feet of torque, which is a lot of torque. Um, and the, ba- the power is limited by the size of the battery. If you get the extended range battery, you will get 563 horsepower and the same 775 foot-pounds of torque. So it can tow, uh, with the max tow package, you can tow up to 10,000 pounds with this truck, uh, which you know, is uh, a little bit less than the maximum you can get with um, the 3.5 liter EcoBoost, which will go up to 14,000 pounds. But uh, it's still, you know, it's, it's more than most people will ever need. Uh, Redacted asks about the safety rating. We don't know yet um, what the, the safety rating is going to be. Um, the, the front crumple zone, I don't think should be uh, an issue. You know, it's going to be, I, I, would, I expect it's going to be very similar to the standard F-150 um, because the front part of the frame is is essentially the same once you get past the front axle is is where it starts to be significantly different uh and they've completely redesigned that part to support the, the weight of the battery uh did toby announce a range on the forty thousand uh, dollar from toby did ford announce a range for the forty thousand dollar version yeah the forty thousand dollar base version standard range is going to be 230 miles and then the extended range version uh, will start at fifty thousand dollars and that will get you 300 miles of range um let's see distance for those uh, from Keith. Uh, I'm not sure what you're asking me there, Keith. Uh, if you're talking about the range, uh, yeah, it's 230 and 300 miles. Uh, let's see. Uh, lots of, uh, uh, thank you, uh, Tech Dino. I'm happy to share the information. Uh, and you know, what we're going to see is very, I think, very similar specs from GM, uh, from other manufacturers. The um, uh, the Rivian uh, is, you know, they're eventually they're going to have a 250 mile version. The base version of the Cybertruck is also forty thousand dollars, but they're saying about 250 mile range. But that's rear wheel drive. Uh, if you want four wheel drive in that, you're going to have to step up to the fifty thousand dollar version of the Cybertruck. Uh, so if you want four wheel drive, the cheapest possible package right now, the the F-150 is your best bet. Um, the Rivian is going to start at about uh, $67,000, but that's more of a luxury lifestyle adventure truck uh, rather than a work truck. Um, Bob, 12 dozen. After having a two-wheel drive truck in the past, I'd never want another than, want other than four-wheel drive. I hear you there, uh, Bob. Uh, I had a two-wheel drive uh, GMC S15 uh, through my college years, and uh, it was definitely a handful in wintertime. Uh, let's see, what else? Uh can you buy the truck with Dogecoin uh, from CJ? Uh, I believe the answer to that question, CJ, is no. Um, I do not think that Ford will accept any form of cryptocurrency right now. You will have to convert that to U.S. dollars or some other uh, con- you know, f- conventional currency first before you can buy it. Uh, let's see. Uh I foresee brake issues with the weight um, from Kate uh, WMS. Uh, actually, I don't think that that's going to be so much of an issue because the thing you have to keep in mind, like all other electric vehicles, uh, this vehicle you know will have um, you know a lot of regenerative braking capability. Uh, one of the the demo rides I took in it uh, was uh, on the on the Ford Proving Grounds on their hill route uh, going up and down. We pulled a six thousand pound trailer up. Uh, a 25% grade uh, with no problem at all. And then going down the grades, you're, you're using a lot more regenerative braking. So there's actually a lot less wear and tear on yeah. the, the friction brakes. I never use my brakes on my uh, Mach-E. 
<clears throat> just yeah. one pedal driving. It comes to a stop. And I think they yeah, use the F one fifty's got the same one pedal mode. Yeah, I think they use the cameras because they stops it stops right at the you know at the bumper of the car in front of it, no matter what. So <laughs> it's pretty. That it's could pretty be. Nice. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised yeah. if they do that. Sam, that was great. Thank you. You're welcome. Let's Leo. do that at, uh, any Sunday. Crowd. You in the mood? All right, sounds good. We'll put it in the podcast too, so it's not lost forever. All right. Have a good day. Take care. See you you next week. week. Bye-bye. Well, hey, hey, hey. How are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Time to talk computers and the internet and home theater and digital photography. We've got smartphones. You've got smart watches. No, I have them. Nobody else has them. No, actually, I think the Apple Watch has done quite well. Come to think of it. I was talking last hour about Google announcing, yeah, we're all, we're coming back with where... These Google Wear watches, and I just, I just, uh, I, I just kind of feel for them. <laughs> it's like, okay, have fun with that. Good luck. You're a little late to the party, I'm afraid. Eighty-eight, eighty-eight. Ask Leo the phone number if you want to talk high tech. Eight, 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 two, seven, five, five, three, six. There is a website. We put it up just for you. Uh, we put it up at the. Uh, Address techguylabs.com. There's no sign-up. There's no fee. There's no charge at all. Uh, it's there for your edification and amusement. And uh, James is writing everything down, as I say it, even that. So it'll all be there. You don't have to write anything down. All the information you need. Techguylabs.com. My friend G. Scott on the line from Finland, Mich Minnesota. Hello, <laughs> Hello G. Scott. <laughs> Hey, Leo, how are we doing today? I am doing great. How are you? Oh, I'm pretty good. i just taken a couple of minutes off of work here, sitting at my desk today, so I'd give you a shout. It's nice to hear from you. What do you think of that uh, F-150 Lightning that uh, Ford announced? Yeah, it looks pretty nice. Uh, saw the Prez there putting his foot down. Yeah, the floor, yeah, you know, Joe Biden drove it a couple of days nice. before the reveal. So, But I think electric vehicles in Minnesota might not be the best choice. I don't know. It's, climate's tough there, huh? Climb is tough, you know, the, and the four-wheel drive certainly be a necessity. Um, although a heavy truck, you know, you get a uh, little extra traction in sure. that regard. That's so nice, yeah. Maybe not so bad. Yeah. But the charging, you know, you got the you got the solar on your roof for for uh, for that. We don't get quite that much sun, you know. Yeah. No, this I know. Year, maybe a little more, but uh, I love my electric vehicle because I feel like, <clears throat> well, I'm just I'm charging it from the sun. It's free, but uh, that's not the case everywhere, is it? What can I do for you, Mr. Scott? Well, I have this Epson printer. No. No, please. <laughs> no. <Nah>. No printer <laughs> <Just> questions. <No. laughs> Actually, um, so I, I, I'm, I'm a Samsung guy. I've got a Galaxy watch, and, and, you know, I get around good with that. But I just got my wife the Apple watch. And um, when I called and checked on it, they said she could do pretty much everything she could do on her phone. But it doesn't come with a browser. And, the know, watch. Um, the watch does not come with a browser. You wouldn't want to browse the internet on your on your watch. She has an iPhone though, right? She's got an iPhone, okay. but you know, she's all riding her bicycle. Does you know she want to look up uh, a menu at the burger joint there that you know we're heading to or something? Yeah, like that, no, know? yeah, you really wouldn't want to do that on the Apple Watch. If you if she, does she take her phone with her when she's riding? Not so much, you know, yeah. that's why we got her into the bike, into the uh, watch for biking. Yeah, so it won't, so you could, it, you can't use Siri without the phone. It won't, you can't say, hey, what's, you know, where's the nearest burger place? It uses the phone for a lot of that stuff. So it is going to be right. fairly limited uh, in, and certainly no browsing. But, you know, I thought, may, oh, maybe you could ask, you know, you know who uh, for, uh, you know, I don't think you could even say the menu because there's nowhere to display it. She'll see when she did. She get the watch yet? She does have it, and you know, mostly, you know, she likes counting her steps, and it'll it'll track That's, her. I mean, when she's yeah. uh, riding the bike, it tells her, yeah, she rode, you know, twelve point six miles or whatever, and and uh, so you know, she's she's having fun with it, and it's great for that. Yeah. Uh, basically, when these watches came out. I was a little skeptical because it is such a small screen and, you know, you, it's touch, but, you know, you can't really touch anything because it's so small. You can't, you know, you can't be expect. It's hard to type or anything. There is a keyboard. You can draw letters as well, but it's pretty hard to do. And then, and then you, you know, you have a stem, like a winding stem, and you have a button. You don't have a lot of controls. So I was a little skeptical. 
at first, I think Apple wasn't sure exactly what these were for. They thought of it as a kind of a, a companion to your phone. So when the phone rings, your watch says, hey, you're getting a call from, from uh, G. Scott. Or when the, a message comes in, you can read it and that kind of thing. And they, I think that's what they initially thought it was mostly for. And then health came along. And that's really what has sent this watch through the roof. The ability to track your exercise, keep, tr you know, keep, keep you going, motivate you to do more with those rings. Does she try to fill in her rings and all that stuff? Yeah, yeah, that's kind of funny. And, and, and I am not there to help her. I'm in Minnesota. She's out in Tahoe at, at the winter home. She's actually Californian now. So, so I thought, well, I'll call you, and then I can relay to, relay to her what's the... Uh, What's the best way to, you know, use the watch? Yeah. You've obviously had several now. <laughs> I've had them all since the day <laughs> they uh, first shipped. Uh, you know, they you could put apps on it. So a lot of people, for instance, will listen to music or books on audiobooks and that kind of thing on there. You could check the weather. You know, there are, <laughs> I see I have a chess game on it, but uh, I don't think I could actually play chess on it. I think it's, yeah, it's, tight, it, yeah. yeah. I think the whole idea really is it's a companion for the phone. The phone has the big screen. When you're just using the watch, there's, you can make and take phone calls. You can make, uh, you can receive text messages, and you can respond to them. It's a little challenging. I tend to respond to text messages with emoji, like a thumbs up or a thumbs down, more than. And they have little canned phrases you can use too, but you don't really want to type sure. anything too long. You can dictate, and I uh, I use my watch to take notes. I have a program called Drafts. I can press a button on my watch and just start talking to it. And once it gets back to the phone, it'll upload that all to the phone uh, and then I can use it in other ways so there, there are things you can do with it it can record but yeah I don't think I, I think that particular example is of, of saying what's the menu at the burger bar is not going to be one of the things she's going to use it for okay well you know you just gave me a thought though back in the flip phone days I used to call my dad and have him look yeah, things up. Yeah, you could do that. On the watch. She could call you and say, hey, <laughs> read me the menu. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Okay, well, you know, sometimes I'm, uh, I'm old a, tried and true. Yeah, I'm hesitant to say too much about what the watch can't do because Apple keeps impressing me with the things that they manage to shoehorn into this thing. Just remember, it's a small screen, really small. It's a s right. slow processor. You can't put you don't want to put a giant processor in there. Your battery life would go to nothing. And so, right. you know, not a lot of memory. So it's very limited in the computer like things it can do. It's really designed as a companion to the phone for that stuff. Okay. Okay. So, you know, and, and I mean, my Galaxy Watch, you know, I kind of get that. It's similar. Those same. Yeah. Okay. So, so she's not getting that much more. She's an iPhone. I'm a, I'm an Android. You have a so, mixed you know, marriage. Yeah. A yeah. mixed marriage. Yeah. 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 But we, I, we've had one for, for several decades now. So yeah, I guess it works <laughs> one way or another. She'll get you over because at some point she's going to say, I want to do walkie talkie with G Scott and uh, you need an Apple Watch. And she's going to make you get an iPhone to go with it. I suspect. I predict. <laughs> I, I'm a, I'm a hold. On. I don't know. I've been you know I've been a Note since the Note two, and and I just I, I get brand loyal. And oh, I don't blame you. I, uh, and of all the of all the non Apple Watch smartwatches, I think Samsungs are the best. Although Samsungs kind of thrown in the hat, thrown in the towel as well. They 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 have their own operating system called Tizen. And they announced this week, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna merge. They say merge Tizen with Google, but what the, what's really gonna happen is that they're gonna start using Wear OS on their watches so that you can get the Google Play Store on there because that's where all the apps are. So, I think sure. that's probably good news for Google Wear watch users because it means that it's not completely abandoned. And with Samsung putting its energy behind it, I think maybe uh, it'll get better and more useful. But the king of the hill right now is the Apple Watch. It really is. But don't think of it as a computer. Yeah. It's a, it's an, it's a companion. Right. Okay. Well, you know, I mean, and she, like I say, she loves the thing, and and I'm happy to have gotten it for her. And, oh yeah. And, uh, it's kind of her her first accessory. She's not. Uh, she's kind of you know. She claims to not be tacky, but I tell you, she's pretty sharp. She's getting there. She's getting there. There you go. Thank you, G yeah. Scott. Yeah. Great to talk right, to you. Talk to you Leo. Stay warm. Take care. Summer's coming. Summer's on its way sometime in the next few months. Uh, I I gave my mom, my 88-year-old mom, an Apple Watch because of the fall 
feature. You know, it detects a fall and can offers to call emergency services. And for that alone, I thought, this is great. And she loves it. She uses it for all sorts of things. Timing things, recording things, reminders. Great for reminders. When I'm cooking, I will use the uh, Apple Watch, especially if I'm barbecuing. I'll, I'll use the Apple Watch to set the timer because it's always on me as I'm walking around. Uh, so I don't miss the, uh, the alarm. Things like that. Uh, I, I, I've come around. I was fairly skeptical when the Apple Watch came out. I thought, well, this is not that. This is kind of a toy. But it's become more and more useful as time has gone by. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Chris Marquardt, our photo guy, coming up just around the corner. Meanwhile, our uh, Amazon Echo expert, Dr. Mom, is on the line, my personal chat physician. Hello, Dr. Mom. Hey, Leo. <laughs> Good to talk to you. <laughs> Good to talk to you, too. A couple of new things this week. Just a reminder to everybody, Amazon has turned on Sidewalk. And they turned on everybody's Sidewalk on all their devices unless you go in and turn it off. Uh, I thought they were going to turn it on in, uh, in June. I think it's coming well, soon. I looked at mine and it was already turned on. It's already turned on. Interesting. Yeah, so I immediately turned it off. Okay. You don't like that idea, yeah. huh? Well, the only thing I could use it for is I have a mailbox... I'm in San Diego. Our mailboxes are down the street, but it's a metal mailbox covered with a stone facade, and yeah, there's no, no radio transmitter <laughs> in the world that's going to get the signal out. The idea of sidewalk, though, is it's not just for you. The idea is Amazon wants to create a low-power network over your entire neighborhood. The uh, It's long-range, the sidewalk in your Echo, and most modern Echoes, and sold in the last couple of years, have this built in, uh, will transmit as much as half a mile. So it doesn't. It's not a lot. A lot of data. It's not a. It's not like the Wi-Fi network. It's really a location network for location tracking. Tile's going to use it, but also you know your dog collar could use it. Uh, as you mentioned, they they sell a, a mailbox sensor that could tell you when the mail's in. I think Amazon has a lot of ambitions uh, with Echo. Echo devices, Ring cams, uh, all all use it. It's Bluetooth, 900 megahertz. Um, and uh, privacy is a big thing for Amazon. They they understand people don't really trust Amazon. So, but you're you're right. If you don't want, if you don't like this idea, uh, you can you have to. It defaults to on, so you have to go into your Amazon Echo app, the A Word app, and turn it off there. Uh, it's inter Yeah, it's interesting. They've they've they powdered on a little earlier. I I'm not convinced. You know, when we first talked about it, I I agreed with you. I thought this is kind of an invasion of privacy, but it's very much separate from you. You know, it's it doesn't have any information about you in it. It's just uh, they're just trying to create a uh, location network. Right. Okay, and the other thing is, if you remember when they talked about the new Echo Show 10, they said you were going to be able to use it as an interior security camera. Yeah. Well, they turn, they turn that option on in every single Echo Show. <laughs> So what does that mean? It means that if you go into the settings, go to camera, you can turn on to use it as an interior security camera. Then you can go to your app or any of your other video devices, Echo video devices, and start looking through the camera on that show. Okay. You couldn't do that before, huh? They were just going to they was going to start with the newer 10 and they said, "Well, that was wonderful because you could scan the camera around and look at people." They turned it on in everything. Wow, I'll have to look and see. Um, so, huh, now, interesting. Good things about it. This is not drop-in. It's not like you say, I'm calling this unit, and the other person has to accept it. It's on your network. The other person does not have to accept it. You could just turn it on. So they have no way of saying no. But it puts a splash screen up that says somebody's looking at the camera. Oh, wow. So you know you're being watched. <laughs> wow. You know, the reason I, I'm you know, not hyper aware of this or concerned about it is because I also have Google Nest Hub Max devices, which are similar to the Echo Shows and have cameras built in. And I've been using them to monitor my office in the kitchen for some time now. So I'm kind of, well, I've, I can, I've kind of been doing that. Yeah, I could easily see using it as a baby monitor. Yeah. Uh, keeping an eye on grandparents, elderly. My mother's in her late nineties. It alerts me if there's somebody in my office, and there shouldn't be in anybody in my office. So it's, you know, that's a nice thing to know. Right, but if you look, once you turn it on, if you look in your Echo devices, it shows up as a security camera. Right, right, yeah, 
Interesting. Yeah, it is, though, if you think about it. It's a camera in your house. It's a security camera. Does it alert you if there's motion? Does it Will it alert you? You can set those things up. You can put it into routines and stuff like turn it on at certain times. Uh, tell me if there's motion. But the big thing is it puts up a splash screen on that particular so device. So the, the crook will know you're watching them. See, the uh, the Google devices, the Nest devices do not do that. Uh, I think a, I think a little light comes on, a little red light comes on that it's you're being recorded, but that's about it. So yeah, uh, this one puts yeah, it's probably better. On the other hand, the crooks now know I'm looking at you. <laughs> Maybe that's what you want. <laughs> Maybe it'll scare them, out, scare them out of there. Yeah, yeah. My wife does not like the idea of cameras in the house at all. And so it's good to know that this show, which does have a camera, um, but couldn't be used that way before, can now be used now. I, I will go through and make sure those are all disabled. It's funny. Our 18... It's disabled by default. Yeah. Oh, you it's have to turn it on. Default, right okay. Now. Okay. Good. You have to turn it on. Good. That's the way it should be. Our 18-year-old goes around and turns all these devices face down, even the ones that don't have cameras. He does, he does not like the idea of anything watching him at any time. But he's 18. Of course not. Like I said, I see it as if you want to use it as a baby monitor. Yeah. Uh, like you said, your office, nobody's yeah. supposed to be in there. Yeah. Yeah. But it's when, useful. Yeah. When we moved into the house we're in now, it's a 90-plus-year-old couple who lived there. There were security cameras in every single room, including the master bedroom and the bathroom. Wow. Was that well, set up by the couple, or do you think maybe by the couple's kids? I think it was by the couple's kids, and I think considering the one in the master bedroom was pointed at the bed, it was for sign of life checks. Yeah. To make sure that grandpa had gotten up in the morning. A, a lot of, I know a lot of uh, adult kids do that for their parents, but of course you would want to make sure they knew. And I think a lot of older parents would say, under no circumstances are you putting a camera in my bedroom. There are other ways to check for sign of life. There are devices you can wear and things like that. Well, remember the Echo now has that, Thing where it can listen to see if your parents get up. Yeah. They're moving around. Yeah. If they yell That's a little them. less intrusive, I think. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Dr. Mom, always a pleasure. Thanks for calling. Okay. Talk I appreciate to you it, Lil. All right. Up. You take care. Enjoy San Diego. The, I bet the weather's beautiful down there right now. Coming up in just a little bit, Chris Marquardt, our photo guy. We're going to do a little uh, uh, lesson in landscape photography. We'll talk a little bit about taking landscape pictures. This is not just for your fancy cameras. This is for anything. Your camera phone, too. That's just around the corner as we continue. And of course, if you've got a question or a comment or a suggestion, just give me a ring. 8888-ASK-LEO. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. It's time for our photo guy, Chris Marquardt. Sensei.photo. And just a little program note from GM93 in our chat room. The drummer on that song, Muscle Shoals music legend Roger Hawkins, passed away uh, yesterday at the age of 75. So he's the guy laying down that rhythm section on Kodachrome. Wow. Yeah. Uh, he, was, uh, he was in traffic, among other bands, and a stu great studio musician. So, hello, Chris Marquardt. Hello, Leo. Chris helps us get better uh, pictures by thinking about what we're doing instead of just, <laughs> like I do, putting the camera in my eye and snapping it. What are, today we're going to talk about landscapes. Yeah, because because we, we're finally in that part of the year, at least here in the Northern Hemisphere, where you um, you can be out early in the morning without freezing to death. And that's a very good time to take landscape photos. So it's picking up again and spring is beautiful and uh, everything is in bloom again. So landscape photography is, is for some people a seasonal thing and the spring is a very good time to do it. So, um, yeah, landscapes. I guess a lot of people who, who travel and maybe start picking it up again or even people who live in amazing landscapes um, want to take good photos of, of the landscape. So I've put together a little gallery of other people's photos over on Flickr and um, you will probably put the link in the show notes of we the will. show. So, we will. What's um, different about landscape and, photography? I mean, I know it's pictures of trees and bushes and mountains and skies but yeah. <laughs> what 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 do we have to think about when we're doing it well you know you know landscapes are um all the rules apply that we talk about uh, having a subject and and 
doing making a nice composition. But then there are also things in landscape photos that are um, kind of typical for landscape photos and that have proven to work well. So, for example, uh, landscape photographers like to put something in the foreground, something in the middle ground, something in the background. They like to layer things. So there is uh, very often in good landscape photos or in landscape photos that are let look intriguing, you find something like a, a rock or a, a branch or something in the foreground. And then there's um, a, some middle ground maybe. The one you're showing for the people who watch the video is there's just flowers in the foreground and then there's a tree in the middle ground and then there's um, something in the back, in the, in the background. So you have this layered structure and doing it this way. I mean, it's just wonderful because if you have something in the foreground, then your eyes, it's almost like a landing strip for your eyes where you come into the photo and then you explore it from the, from, from the bottom to the top. And um, that's something I always try to do in landscape photos. Um, foreground, by the way, can also help make a photo more tidy, as in you can use something in the foreground to hide something that might be unsightly <laughs> in a photo. I like. I also like to to reduce um, photos to less uh, to fewer colors. So uh, sometimes in landscapes you might see like a dramatic sky that has warm tones in it, like the sun, the morning sun or the evening sun, um, blasting light, a, a warm light at the clouds, while the foreground is still sort of in shadow and that's more bluish. So you end up with a reduced color palette. And time of day in general. Is, is really crucial for landscape photography. You will see landscape photographers around sunrise and around sunset. Yeah. That's the two times. There is other landscape photography for sure, but um, those are the times of the day when the light is super warm and very low. So you get long shadows, you get interesting shapes and things. Um, I, worry, another question I worry about that, being tr trite and taking sunset pictures too much. I always worry about that. Like, um, well, that's the obvious. I mean, the sun, a sunset doesn't have to be just the sun in uh, in, in Hawaii on the beach. That is one of those typical uh, sunset photos. But a sunset photo can also be just the sun shining at something yeah. during sunset. Then it's and golden. That and that changes different. how it yeah. looks and it's yeah. golden and that is yeah. different. Um, what I look for in landscapes is also interesting skies. Um, skies, just the plain blue sky is one of the boring, most boring things that you can yes, take a photo yes, of. So I hate it. the only thing more I boring than a plain blue sky is a plain cloudy sky. Just well, white clouds. And that's, and that's when I <laughs> that's when I decide if I want to include a lot of the sky or maybe not. Right, so uh, right. it's, it's definitely possible to take a landscape shot from a bit of a higher vantage point where you completely exclude the sky. Mm -hmm. That's definitely possible. Mm -hmm. um, or if the sky is is stunning and the clouds are amazing and the light on the clouds is amazing, then uh, you could you could make that shot almost entirely about the sky. You could raise the camera and just have a little strip of landscape on the bottom and make it a, a sky photo. So that's another way to deal with this. Um, if you, if, by the way, if you don't find a good foreground for your photo, a trick that I see often and that I use often is. I just lower the camera and the further you lower the camera, the more whatever is in the foreground becomes bigger. And then you can, this way you can make a, a I don't know, a gravel road interesting by having it close to the camera, by lowering the camera. So yeah. uh, you, you will, you will see professional uh, landscape photographers. Sometimes they will just lie on their belly, the camera really low. So they have this one flower in the foreground and those mountains in the background. So position is definitely uh, important. This is this is one of those things where uh, uh, if you could certainly do it with any camera, but if you have a camera with lots of megapixels, a big fancy camera, and a slightly wide angle lens, you maybe you get a more of a traditional landscape yeah, shot, no, right? Yeah. Yes. Yes, and no. Um, the all all I've talked about so far is fairly independent of the camera. You can you can take. A lot of these shots with a current iPhone or an Android phone, they have all very good wide-angle lenses. That's true. Now, so you can, it's true. Yeah. You can do this, get close to something, and you even have a bit of an advantage with a smartphone because it has a smaller sensor. And that, in landscape photography, can be beneficial because 
you um, with a smaller sensor, there's more in focus, and that's what uh, uh, landscape photographers are often looking for. That everything from that thing in the front uh, to the mountains in the in the background are in focus, and a smartphone will have an easier time doing this than your big fancy mid medium format uh, camera that costs you ten thousand bucks. So it it really is. Uh, a uh, smaller sensor can really be a, an advantage in landscape photography. Mm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good point. You don't really see the the, the uh, portraiture style, you know, big bokeh, blurry backgrounds in landscape not, photography. You want to see everything, right? You want to see all the not, details. Uh, oh, by, by the way, one, one last tip. Morning shots are usually calmer. There is less wind in the morning. They might look uh, similar to the evening shots, to the sunset shots, but a sunrise shot is often more pleasing because things don't move as much. So interesting. Just to keep that in yeah. the back of your mind. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. This looks, I could tell this is a morning shot because it just feels that way too. It is a morning shot and it has a really reduced palette. You can see the colors. There's only like two major colors in that photo and that makes it very tidy, very reduced. The foreground is green and the sky is more purplish and um, that that helps. Yeah, that helps make the photo a bit more compelling. Yeah, it's a beautiful Chris, shot. Chris Marquardt. Now we have an assignment that we're working on, right? Yep, the zigzag Z assignment is still on. Zigzag. So that means it, it's not a competition. There are no prizes. It's just an excuse to get out there and take pictures with whatever camera you've got to hand. Find a picture that illustrates the word, the idea, the concept. Zigzag. When you get a good one, it should be a new photo. Upload it to Flickr, Flickr.com. That's our photo sharing site. We have a group there called the Tech Guy Group. In the Tech Guy Group, there are many photos, many, many users, 13,000, I think, at last count. There's also the wonderful moderator, Renee Silverman. Tag your photo TG Zigzag for Tech Guy Zigzag. And in a couple of weeks, maybe next week, I don't know, we'll review, pick three, and talk about them. Chris Marquardt, he's our photo sensei at sensei.photo. Nice. Love. You know why I love to take landscapes? Because I don't have to ask anybody for permission to take their picture. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and Bhutan, Bhutan, I can only... I can only make your mouth go watery because th those landscapes in Bhutan... I bet. Oh, you got the, Something the uh, Himalayas there, plant. right? Oh, that's going to be amazing. Wonderful, wonderful. Can't wait. Can't ah. wait. All right. Thank you, Chris. All right. Have a wonderful week. Um, next week, I might be... Let me just check. Uh, I might not be around next no week. No problem. Just Sunday. drop us a Cause, note. Because of that know. visit, my parents' visit. Oh, of course. As... As soon as I know details, but yeah, let's just let's just say no, I won't be there because All right. I'll be traveling. No, Chris Mark next week. Easier. Okay, we'll do the review and then in two the week weeks. After I'm back. Cool. That's perfect. All right. Thanks. Take care. See you in two weeks. Bye. Is that a little Muscle Shoals music I hear? Leo Laporte, the tech guy, eighty-eight, eighty-eight. Ask Leo. Paul is on the line from Lansing, Michigan. Hello, Paul. Hello. Hello. What can I do for you? Uh, well, thank you for, for everything you do. Appreciate My pleasure. It. Thank you. My pleasure. So I have, um, I'm kind of the tech guy for like my friends and family. Nice. Sometimes it, it turns into. Just don't let them ask you any printer questions. Okay. That's all I'm saying. Oh, I've been there. Um, <laughs> I'm just teasing. I don't mind. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I've, got this uh, HP Stream. It has four gigs of RAM. Oh, those Windows HP 10. streams are going to be the bane of my existence because they don't put enough yeah. storage on them. I bet you're having trouble upgrading Windows on them. Oh, it's, that's he's like, my buddy's telling me, oh, it's up, update, and it's doing the same to me, update, update. It won't because and there's only 32. I can't delete anything. There's no storage on there. There's 32 gigs of storage on that thing. I'm so mad at HP for selling this. It's basically a netbook. Remember the netbooks? What a horrible, horrible idea those yep. were. Welcome back. Uh, their idea is that they want to make a computer that can compete with a Chromebook. 
So they sell them for 300 bucks and then people get them and they can't, they can't do anything with them. Right. And, you know, I was talking about this yesterday. I feel bad. People call all the time and say, uh, you know, I want to buy a laptop. And I say, what's your budget? And they say 300 bucks. And my, I, I, I don't want, I don't want to say, oh, well, you can't get something for 300 bucks. You can. But golly, if you could spend a little bit more, it, it, I don't know where we got the idea that computers should only be 300 bucks. These are complicated, fancy uh, devices. And, uh, you you know, you get you get a the stream, and the, one of the ways they cut the price is by putting so little storage in there. Uh, and the problem with it is, it doesn't have enough storage to upgrade Windows. Exactly. So, it was his nephews, and so there's two account. I don't have the password to his nephews. There's another care. problem. You got to wipe the whole thing. I want to wipe. Yeah, time to I wipe. Wipe it. it. Um, yep. I want to put Linux. Oh, probably okay. Mint. Okay. Is what was suggested. I've done this before in the past, but for some reason, I have the USB sticks and everything. I have an iMac and a MacBook Pro, all that stuff. Um, I can't get, I can't figure out how to get Linux on it. And it was suggested with only four gigs of RAM to do Mint. No, I think you could install Windows. Linux on it, but. Uh, it, 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 there, you know, so Linux is a free operating system. It's actually a really good operating system. It is right up there with Mac OS and Windows, and I think in some respects superior to Mac or Windows. And it's free. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that's, you know, all this. I'm just telling the rest of the folks, Paul. Uh, you're the tech guy too, so you know. But uh, one of the things that's cool about Linux is uh, because it's free and open source. There are a variety of different Linuxes. He says he wants to use Linux Mint, which is a very good one for people who are used to Windows. It's very Windows-like. It may be Mint. You know, my experience has been there. I, I use a number of different distros. My experience has been sometimes one distro will work and when another one doesn't. And it maybe is a hardware compatibility issue or whatever. I'm sure you've already done this, but of course, before you install Linux, you have to turn off secure boot in the, in the BIOS setup. You've done that, I hope. No, I haven't. Ah, so Windows machines, and this was something people thought was anti-competitive of Microsoft, and it, 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 I don't think it was, but the goal was to make it harder for a bad guy to modify the operating system. They have something called Secure Boot, which means the operating system has to be signed to be installed. There are some Linuxes you can install on Secure Boot, but it, usually what you have to do is go into the setup, uh, and once you're in setup, disable secure boot at that point mint should install just fine but if it doesn't there's others i really like pop os which is another great uh, um, uh, linux distro from a company that makes linux hardware called system 76 um, manjaro m-a-n-j-a-r-o is another good one mint is nice because it's based on ubuntu it's very solid it looks like windows the dis desktop uh, environment they use cinnamon is is very easy for people who are used to Windows to use. Is this going to be for your the nephew or for your f friend or for you? Who's going to be using this? For my, for my friend, he just wants to use it for um, making invoices for his company. Okay. That's all. Yeah, and, it, and he can do that in a browser? Because it's kind of Apple-like. Can he do that in a browser? The, uh, the, what, what does he use to make invoices? Um, I... I probably, I don't know, one of the free ones. Okay. So Linux. so what I would look at also is I would Google that model, you know, HP Stream, whatever, and Linux. Because okay. if there are issues, people will have blogged and posted about them. Somebody in the chat room is saying, and this is probably true, the UEFI on this is 32-bit. So uh, Grub, which is a 64-bit bootloader, is going to have trouble with it. Um, I have actually run into that on other machines. You can modify Grub or you can try uh, turning off UEFI and go into compatibility mode and boot it that way. But that's a bigger topic. The details of how to do that, you're going to want to get online. If you, if, uh, if you just Google HP Stream and Linux Mint or, you know, like that, there will be somebody who's gone through all this who will say, okay, well, here's what you have to do, and it'll all be there. Okay. Uh, in fact, okay. iFixit has how to install 
<laughs> I love you, iFixit. iFixit.com yeah. has how to install Ubuntu on the HP stream. So uh, yeah. they'll have some tips in there. Paul, okay. a pleasure talking Wonderful. to you. You're doing a good thing. The nice thing about this is is Linux will run fine in 4 gigs of RAM and on 32 gigs of storage, uh, and you won't have trouble with updating. And uh, I think you'll be better off. And, and shame on anybody for selling a computer you can't update because there's so little storage on it. Who thought that was a good idea? Come on, man. That's just nuts. Uh, Reza on the line from West L.A. Hello, Reza. Yes, hello, Leo. How are you? I'm wonderful. How are you? Well, thank you. Uh, so uh, here's my question. Uh, are you aware of uh, some kind of Windows 10 uh, uh, housekeeping utility or something that ramps up your disk every time you boot up up to 100% that turns your laptop almost... <laughs> it bricks it. <laughs> that. Why do you think it's the disk? Is it the fan? What is it? Do you have a monitor system? Well, I see it. I see it. You could see the disk blinking? Well, no. I look at my task manager. Ah, you could see it in task manager. Okay. Yeah, so task manager will show disk access. Um, there are some things Windows does, like uh, it does indexing of the file system. Right. Uh, but so, it, it shouldn't make it unusable for any length of time at all, or at all. Well, so, so if your disk, if the throughput is 100% taken, then everything else either comes to a halt right. or extremely slow. So it so could be you've got uh, some buggy process taking up all of. Look, look at the look at in the task manager. Look what's doing it, and try to see what that is, and see if it's something legit or it's something maybe you installed or worse. It could be some malware. It could also be that the disk itself is getting hard to read, and Windows. And this is actually the most common cause of slowdowns in Windows. And Windows has to try really hard to read that portion of the disk. If that's the case. A new disc might be in order. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. There's, um, it's, it's so, an, oh, he hung up. Yeah, Process Explorer is good. That's uh, from uh, Mark Krasinovich. That will let you know. But even Task Manager will tell you what's writing or reading the disc. So those are the three possibilities, that there is some system process that's doing it unlikely malware possibly but most likely it's just hard to read the disk and it's having trouble but that is a great uh, tool process explorer from uh, marcus sinovich from the sys internals folks uh, but the, you know if, if it's an older hard drive could be a lot of things could be a lot of things well hey 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 how are you today leo laporte here the tech guy time to talk computers the internet home theater Digital photography, smartphones, smartwatches, all that jazz. 8888 Ask Leo's the phone number, 888 827 5536. Toll free from anywhere in the US or Canada, outside that area. You can still call, but you, you know, you have to use Skype or something like that. 8888 Ask Leo website where all the answers to all your questions live, techguylabs.com. We actually, uh, we have somebody writing this all down, our scribe, James DeRuvo. So if you hear something and you go, oh, what was it? Right, let me write that down. No, no, you're busy. You got other things to do. Fear not when it, at your leisure, when it's convenient, just go to techguylabs.com. It'll all be there. This is episode 1,799. So uh, the, the, the website's divided into shows. Yes, there are 1,700. I didn't start at 1,000. No, there are 1,000. I started at 1. 1,799 episodes. Each episode is divided into hours, 1, 2, and 3. Each hour into segments, 1, 2, 3, and 4. You can usually use that just to get to the part you want. We even put audio and video from the show. Yeah, even video afterwards. Uh, TechGuyLabs.com. Uh, let's see. Andrew's next from Ventura, California. Or is it Venture, California? Hi, Andrew. <laughs> yeah, we'll stick the A on the end. It's Ventura. Ventura. I uh, thought it might be. Okay. I've got two things. First of all, you were talking about the Amazon Echo and uh, 
devices. Yes. yes. I have uh, been asking, and I've put on, uh, I put on some of the blogs or chat rooms or whatever it is. They have a whisper mode, which is great. If you whisper to it, it'll ask you, "Hey, should I whisper back?" And it's wonderful. It's very peaceful at night. Isn't that funny? Yeah, they added that about a year ago. You can say, what I'm asking for echo. is a dark mode. If oh, you've got your device next to the bed. Yes, I don't want it flashing. It's no, you turn off the radio. I don't want it flashing a bright blue light in the room. No. So I'm asking for a dark mode, which you could control by voice, and you could go into the device settings and tell it. Turn on dark mode at 11 o'clock and turn it off at sunrise or something like that. And so I've gone on to Thingiverse and I 3D printed a little cover for it. Oh, how funny. So my own dark mode. <laughs> a little like you put on a horse that just has little holes for the eyes. You just put that over right. the Echo and, and then go, good night, little Echo. Sleep tight. Oh, you printed it on your 3D printer? Yeah. Oh, I love it. What a great toy. Nice. Tool. Which one do you have? I've got the Prusa i3. Uh-huh. Recommend it? And, oh, I, I recommend it so strongly. I had another one. I had a Tarantula Tivo, mm -hmm. and leveling the bed was difficult, and the wheels were uh, kind of hard rubber, so it was really hard to get a good, stable print. But with the Prusa, uh, every direction, X, Y, and Z, are all double rails, so it's really, really solid. And it does automatic bed leveling in nine spots by itself. That's nice. So out, of, out of the box, my first print was just plain that's awesome. nice. Yeah, that's always been my problem with 3D printers is all the calibration you have to do. So that's oh, nice. Yeah. The, yeah, yeah. And there are dozens and dozens of settings. The math involved in those splicers, <laughs> I got to say, those people are brilliant. Joseph Prusa, it's kind of a, it's an open source thing. So it's it's really yeah. cool. Yeah, what he's done. Yeah. P R U S A three D dot com. It sounds a little funny, uh, you know, buying something out of the Ukraine and but they're selling something like six thousand printers a month. Wow. wow. And it's uh it's reliable, it comes well packed. Um instructions are absolutely beautiful. I don't know if I'm letting the cat out of the bag here, but when you follow the instructions they also include a little bag of gummy bears. <laughs> they, they don't have any THC or anything in them. But, they're, but, they're, but it goes through the instructions and they say, oh, very well done. Now you can have five gummy bears. Oh, that's right. hysterical. It's beautiful. That's not, it's nice when there's a little sense of humor, a little whimsy in there. That's wonderful. They include every tool, screwdriver, pliers, Allen wrenches, everything you need. All you need is electricity. It even comes with a roll of their of their good PLA. Nice, stuff. nice. I love my Prusa. You get me started on that. I'm I think I did. Prusa. And you got the i3, the original uh, Prusa. No, no, the i3. M. I think it's MK i3. MK i3. Ah, yeah. the multi material one. Okay. No, no, that, the multi is the MMU. Oh my goodness, that. it's so complicated. Okay. It, it, yeah, I, I wasn't happy about it, and I sent it back. Oh, okay. I'm not bad mouthing them. I just just didn't work for me. Yeah. So, but I love it. I've I've crafted about half a dozen things. I've put on Thingiverse so far, and uh, the Bruce has got their own uh, blog and repository of things. Of course, they got lots and lots of stuff. Thingiverse is a, is a neat uh, repository of 3D models that you can print with your printer. It's a standard format. That, you know, people ask me uh, from time to time, what should I get for my nephew or whatever? So I'm, I'm going to make a note of this, the Prusa. And it's about 1000 bucks. yeah? Uh, the the base prices was about 700 I think, okay. seven, seven to 800 Okay. And you know what? Well, well worth it. I've learned over the years, always buy the best. It doesn't mean the most expensive, but buy the best. If you're going to grow into it, that's fine. Yeah. You've got room to grow. But if you buy the cheapo, the starter, yeah. right away, as soon as you drive it off the lot, you need more. Yeah. i got another question, if you don't mind. Sure. Logitech MX Master 3. It's a most, Love it. it's a most wonderful mouse. Come My on. hand fits over it without yep. cramping, like on the Apple mouse. I can't hold that for more than a minute. Um, but I've got uh, an iMac. Uh, it's old. I think it's a 2011. And I've got the maximum RAM in it. Uh, I'm running 10.4.1. And I can't get the right driver so that all I, I don't want to use all the fancy features of the mouse. 
I just want to be able to use one of the buttons and be able to go back to the previous web page. Yeah. When I first installed it, the very first time it installed properly, I took that mouse out, I put a different uh, Logitech in, and then I decided to go back to the MX3. I have downloaded all the drivers they have on their web page. None of them will install properly. I've spoken to their uh, technical no support people. There's no help there. I don't know what to do. Did did uh, you get so the I, MX Master 3 for the Mac or just one in general? Because I noticed that they make one for the Mac as well as for Windows machines. And I'm wondering if that has you know, I, somewhat different... I got the generic because yeah. at my printer station, I've got the Mac and a PC. Right. And, and the iPad, yeah. I wonder if they're doing something a little different in the hardware. And as a result, the Mac driver expects that Mac version of the MS, MX Master. Oh. I can't use these because I'm a lefty. And uh, oh yeah, it's a it's very much a right-handed mouse. You can't you can't you can't put it on the other side. So I'm a little of a disadvantage. I look at these and and with awe and wonder, because there's got a place for your thumb to rest and it's got buttons and wheels and knobs and dials. But I just choose their generic uh, Logitech MX mouse, uh, the MX anywhere, yeah, and it's too. it's an it's a fantastic mouse. And I've never had any trouble using it on a Mac or on a PC. But I don't know if I've tried to use the back button. Uh, yeah, I know. I know exactly what you're talking about because there's side buttons on these things, and you can click them, and you could go back and forth in a web page. I think and it, a side it, scroll wheel. Yeah, I you know I I, I note that they make all uh, these mice for Macs as opposed to just the generic one. Makes me think there's something special about the electricity or the hard you know the the, the setup. Um, there is, though, a, a, in our chat room has come up with a suggestion for a third-party driver that might do the job for you. I'm listening. Yeah. It's a, it's a utility called Steer Mouse, S-T-E-E-R Mouse. It's from Japan. It's, it lets you customize buttons, wheels, cursor, cursor speed. Um, it doesn't work with Apple mice, but it looks like they do recommend the MX Master 3. So, and you would be a good thing that well, and and thanks to our chat room, Scooter X is very good at this stuff. So I would at least try that from Plenty. <laughs> I love the name, Plentycom, P L E N T Y C O M dot J P. But I think if you Google Steer Mouse, you'll find it. I'm all over it. There you go. I hope it works for you. And uh, you were you were whistling to what? I think that was Poseidon Adventure. <laughs> I know, there's got to be a morning after. Was I singing that? <laughs> that was completely Freudian. We are not upside down to my knowledge, but we could hit an iceberg at any moment. So, thank you, thank you for the call and for the and for the suggestion to put a little cover over my my <laughs> my my, my uh, Amazon Echo uh, Show. I think that's a good idea. I put it on. Uh, I put it on Thingiverse and called it Dark Mode. Dark mode. What a good uh, idea! Find it with Amazon Echo, Echo or Dot, and it'll. I'm sure it'll pop I up. Will, I will look for it. Thanks for the call. It's great to talk to you. Likewise, thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Take care. Eighty-eight, eighty-eight. Ask Leo. That's the phone number if you want to uh, talk. Uh, <laughs> I don't think. I don't think. Maybe. Uh, maybe Doctor Mom knows. I've never seen a dark mode setting for uh, Amazon Echoes. So I like the physical dark mode. Just put a hood over it, like a falcon. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, 8888. Ask Leo the phone number. Chat room's going crazy. They're saying, wait a minute. You're saying you use your left hand for a mouse? Yes, I do. I'm a lefty, and I use my mouse in my left hand. Now, it's kind of odd, and I'm wondering in your family or your household or your office what people do because my wife who's a lefty and and my stepson who's a lefty both use their mouse in the right hand and i know when they've been using my computer because my mouse migrates over to the right hand side fortunately a lot of companies make mice that don't have any bias they, they just you know they're the same on both they're symmetric or ambidextrous it doesn't matter which hand you use them but that neat mouse that our last caller was using that logitech such a cool mouse is uh, unfortunately designed to put your right thumb in it. You have to use it in the right hand. I guess I should try to get used to it. Try, I just feel, you know, 
If, if you're a righty, try mousing with your left hand. That's how it feels to me when I mouse with my right hand or right with your left hand. You know, you just, you feel inept. You feel like you just don't have the muscles to do it. Chat room has passed along a, a link to an, a mouse from Elecom. Left-handed, 2.4 gigahertz, wireless, thumb-operated trackball mouse. Oh, it's a trackball. Yeah, I've used trackballs before too. I've, I don't. They're not my cup of tea. They're good if you have um, carpal tunnel and you, you know, you don't. Instead of moving your hand around, you just you're just moving the trackball. I've had them. Logitech made one, and I think they still do with the trackball on the top, so I can use it as a lefty. But yes, yes, there is such a thing as a left-handed mouse and left-handed mousers. Don't forget us. Thurman on the line from Wish. Wi Winchester, Winchester, Massachusetts. Hello, Thurman. Yeah, afternoon. Welcome. Uh, I'm a what you might call a, a legacy guy. Uh, been uh, have a whole bunch of code that I wrote in uh, in a 16-bit COBOL compiler back in the uh, 80s. Wow! Did you and, get called uh, in for the Y2K crisis to fix? Yes, I got a few. Um, <laughs> I had left, you know, to be running an investment business since then, but I did get some uh, from uh, temporary agencies wanting me. Thurman, to we need help. <laughs> <laughs> the damage is before yeah so. yeah the next one's uh, coming in 2038 that's when the linux epic ends or the unix and epic ends and we're gonna have to recode mm -hmm. a bunch of unix software oh okay something well, to look forward to well the uh i really i'm gonna, i'm running 32-bit because uh, windows because i can you know run these 16-bit programs uh but i really there's some applications and things i'd like to get that i that are only for a 64-bit you know such as uh, quark express and so forth and but generally to have more more storage so that I don't run out of it when I'm running more than one thing. So I was just wondering, uh, is there any uh, way to, uh, to on a 64-bit Windows, to uh, uh, conveniently, uh, without doing lots of calisthenics and workarounds, uh, run 16-bit programs? Of course, it's, it's not built into these Windows 60. Yeah, there's so... The 32-bit version of Windows, as you know, has a 16-bit subsystem specifically for running those right. old programs. So these are programs you wrote in the 80s that you're still using. Uh, yeah, because, you know, they, I've, I've put a lot of, you know, i got miles of code, and they, and they work wow. still, They work, work quite well. I guess you could get a 64-bit COBOL compiler. Could you do that? Uh, well, there's also Quick Basic 4.5. Yeah, okay. some old utilities that are, are yeah. just lovely. So uh, there is... There is something called NV, I'm sorry, NTVDM, uh, which Microsoft makes uh, to support 16-bit. It's a it's a .dot net feature. Have you tried that? Well, I mean that, that that's I think that's what's running. And when I when I call oh, okay, man prompt. Yeah. Okay, However, so uh, you can you can that. enable that. Oh, uh, there is a, a a weird but very useful control panel that I think a lot of people don't know about uh, called the Windows Features Control Panel. To get it, you press Window Key R to run, and then you type optionalfeatures.exe. Let me just make sure it's... Unfortunately, Microsoft has a bad habit of taking stuff out, mm -hmm. so I'm using the latest Windows 10. Let me just make sure. Yes, it's still there. So uh, Windows Key R for the run command, and then optionalfeatures.exe, and you'll see that NT... VDM is still around. It's a what's called a legacy component. Oh, wait a minute. No, it's not. Oh, bummer, man. They did take it out. Yeah, so, yeah, that's what uh, I mean. They did take right. it out. Uh, this would have run on 64-bit still, but uh, they have they have taken it out, mm. unfortunately. Um, so the next other option is, I'm sorry to say, to run in virtual a uh, virtual machine. And you can run a 16-bit or a 32-bit version of Windows in a, in, a, in a VM. And it'll actually probably run better uh, anyway on a 64-bit Windows machine. Yeah, sure. Uh, okay. So, so, uh, so the, the one I use, and I think most people use, is VMware. It shouldn't cost you, I don't know if it'll even cost you anything, except the cost of the Windows uh, version for it, which you may be able to get for free as well. But VMware has a little engine that will run. I bet you if you go to VMware.com, you can actually find what you need mm -hmm. okay. um, at no cost. But if not, you, you can buy VMware. Yeah, sure. Okay. Yep. All right. Well, that's, 
explore that option. Um, yeah, that's pretty yeah. cool that you have all that old software. You know, I <laughs> I wrote some software in the 80s, but then I, I made the mistake of storing it on floppies. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and they're, oh, I... they're long gone. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, uh, yeah, I'm, so I think that's another way you could do it. There's an emulator uh, called Kimu, Q-E-M-U. That will also do 16-bit software in Windows. That's a free open source project, QEMU.org. Um, so that would also uh, be able to do it. So I think Windows supports virtual this kind of virtual machines very well. So I think okay. Windows will be able to do it, uh, uh, per, it per, performantly. It'll run every bit as well as it did in 1984. I can promise you. Thanks, Thurman. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. It's time for our rocket man. We're heading into space with Rod Pyle, the uh, the uh, author of Space 2.0 and many other books, editor-in-chief of the Ad Astra magazine from the National Space Society. He's our space guy, and we're going to talk about the moon today. Hello, Rod. Hey, oh, how are you? There he is. I am great. How are you? I'm good. I'm getting a little buffering. I hope this continues to be okay. Yeah, you're all right so far. So uh, the super duper okay. moon is this month, or something <laughs> like it. <laughs> what? What's it called? Yeah, it, it, it's 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 the. Oh, where did I put that now? The super blood moon. It's the super blood flower super moon. Blood moon. The super flower Mayflower, blood moon. <laughs> blah -de -blah. Yeah. And a lunar which eclipse, is, which is pretty cool. It, 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 my, yes, my so, memory is somehow that there that the full moon and lunar eclipses must uh, be at the same time. Is that right? It is correct, but Rod is not here with us any longer. He has faded away into distance. Uh, I think we've lost. I'm here. Do you there, want me to call you? Yeah, just call the uh, telephone. You have the hotline number. Let me give uh, it out. Yeah. Let me give. Oh, okay. Better, better not give it out then. Oh, God. <laughs> you call us at the hotline. <laughs> the super flower blood moon is coming. Uh, I think this uh, this weekend. No. And then oh, he's on the hotline. I should just pick it up. There we go. Look at that. The magic of telephony. Now on the plain old telephone line. <laughs> Just like talk radio. Just like talk radio. I remember talk radio. Rod Pyle. So it's the Super Flower Blood Moon, which is a terrible name. And yeah, it's, it's the it's eclipse one. associated. And I asked you before we lost you, I said, is it the case that full moons and eclipses must, you can't have one without the, you can't have an eclipse without the full moon. Is that right? Right, because it's got to pass behind the earth. So this is Wednesday morning, May 26th starts about 2 a.m., but it doesn't really get interesting until about 4. So if you've seen lunar eclipses before, they're, they're very long, you know, and it kind of meanders into the shadow, and it gets gray on the edge, and then it gets grayer, and then finally it starts entering totality, which is when it gets red because that's the light that's allowed to, able to pass through our atmosphere and gets refracted back to the moon. And actually, interestingly, if you were standing on the moon, you'd see the sun blocked up with a red ring around the Earth. So hopefully when the Artemis guys are up on the moon, we'll be able to see what a lunar eclipse looks like from here. We've Wait a minute, say there. that again. If you're standing on the sun, I mean... Stay, you're standing on the moon. If you're standing on the sun, congratulations. Sun. If you're standing on the moon <laughs> looking at the, uh, at the Earth, the Earth is actually eclipsing the sun. Yeah, and then you get this kind of red ring around it because of the refraction through the atmosphere and the blue light gets scattered. So you see oh, that's the red. Cool. So that'll be a neat thing to see. So this is going to be better in the western U.S. because it's it's so late in the morning. Uh, you know, it's, it's entering totality about a little after 4 a.m. here. Um, so if you're on the east coast, the sun will be coming up by then. But you'll be able to see part of it. But people can go on to space.com or griffithobservatory.org, my old workplace, and watch it virtually, which isn't quite as cool, but at least you can see it. So this term supermoon is relatively new. When I was a kid, we didn't talk about it. This is when the moon, uh, full moon occurring when the moon is at perigee, that is its closest to the, uh, to the Earth. Is that right? Right. So, so slightly, it's a degree or two bigger, maybe. 
Yeah, so it'll be 220,000 miles instead of 240,000 miles, which sounds like a lot. But when you're looking at it, you know, you do that gym level thing out of Apollo 13, hold your thumb up, you won't notice that big a difference. But you'll know it's bigger. Right. So you'll think it looks better. Right? <laughs> so, you know, that, that's the important so, part. So we've right. got the blood figured out. We've got the super figured out. Why is it a flower blood super moon? First full moon of May. Oh, so that's the flower. I guess it has to do with late spring, but sure. uh, that I, I wasn't able There's to. There's the harvest moon. This is That's the old farmer's almanac stuff. That's the, every every month has, uh, full moon has its name. Yeah, and I think, you know, we might want to name the next one Leo Laporte moon. <laughs> no, we don't. I think by popular Because <laughs> Because the last time I mooned, I got in trouble. So I'm not mooning anymore. Yeah, I heard that story. <laughs> and I want to see you do that now live on video. <laughs> no, no, no. So we won't. So uh, here the chat room threw out a fancy term for me. This is technically a perigee syzygy. <laughs> yeah, that's what I said. You see... On FCC radio? Yeah, I don't know if I can say it. So it's a perigee because the moon is closest to uh, in its orbit to the Earth. And it's a yeah. syzygy. And that's what's causing the eclipse because the Earth, the moon, and the sun are aligned. Yeah, because the, the moon has a slightly inclined orbit. So only in some of its of its passes behind the Earth does it actually have an eclipse. Otherwise, we'd see it you know, every time it went behind us. Yeah. Um, so the totality is about 4, 418 a.m. on the West Coast okay. in, in our time zone. So I have to, a chance. But totality to, is, just, I mean, how long does it take? It's like hours, right? Yeah, it's like a four-hour eclipse. Okay. So this isn't like the solar eclipse we all love so much that was, for eight, me, eight in, minutes or something. Prineville, Oregon, I was 90 seconds. Oh, I not was, even that long. Wow. Two and a half minutes somewhere else. I think the longest ones are about three minutes. Okay. But, boy, solar eclipse, you know, lunar eclipses are a nice thing to go out and have a bottle of wine. and At four in the morning? Yeah, you go geez, out and do it. <laughs> I'm going to stay in bed. Almost summer. <laughs> solar eclipses, you just got to stand there and stare because they're so riveting. And, and I would really say life-changing. You know, the, I hadn't seen one until I was in my early 60s. And it was one of the most amazing natural things I've ever seen. Yeah. You know, the, it, it, it is amazing. A little bit. Yeah, animal nighttime animals start making noises, you know, yeah. and the air comes rushing into where you are, and you can sometimes see as it's coming. You can see these waves of of diffraction across the across the land as it's coming towards you, and then it's just this dead silence, and the sky turns kind of this pearlescent silver. It's just it's astonishing, and you can see why ancients got flipped out by it. Now, oh sure, you, you know most ancients thought you know there was a dragon eating the moon or. Something, some kind of calamity was coming. The Hoopa Indians up near you in Northern California thought that the moon had been bitten and was bleeding and then it healed after a few hours. That's why it was red. Yeah. They, yeah. Maybe they yeah. didn't yeah. Maybe they didn't think that. Maybe they told a story like that. Like, you know, sometimes I wonder if ancients get, get a bad rap. <laughs> like, they knew, but, you know, it's a story. It's a legend. We're just going to say it got bit. They well, knew. it's a good thing to get some beads from those dumb settlers. They really? Oh, that's really fun, huh? <laughs> Here's some tobacco. Oh, wait, you invented tobacco. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we got plenty of that. We don't need no more of that. So a perigee syzygy this Wednesday at 418 a.m. Pacific time. Uh, but does that mean it'll be, will the sun be up on the East Coast? It's really going to be better the farther yeah. west you are. It'll be better to see this. So Hawaii, exactly. for instance, it'll, yeah. be, it'll be nice. It'll be one, one in the morning. Yeah, but, but, I mean, if you see the beginning of it, you've pretty much seen the end. Just kind of rerun it backwards in your head. So, <laughs> Just shoot the know, first half and then replay it. Yeah. Wherever. Yeah, yeah sure. Exactly. Yeah. And then we got some images back from the Mars, uh, the Chinese Mars rover. It successfully rolled off the landing platform, which was a big deal because JPL had looked at using roll-off ramps for something that size for a long time and had been successful at it. But uh, it's always touchy when you do it the first time. And yeah. the Chinese are really basing their machine on their lunar rover, but it worked. And they're down the surface for at least a three-month mission, and they're starting to take pictures. And this is not terribly far from the Viking 2 landing site, so it looks a little similar, a fewer rocks. But it's high enough north that we should see some frost and so forth build up as the seasons change. So that's going to be exciting. Isn't it funny how we? it almost becomes commonplace now? It's like, oh, yeah, we got a yeah. Chinese landed another one up there. It's going to be pretty soon you're going to have a parking problem. They're going to have to build some structures or something. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I wonder, you know, when we have astronauts on the moon again, I wonder how long it's going to take that become, to become the norm. Because it's, it's never, you know, I will... will 
It, stand up and cheer like a madman, but the it first time, like it was the first. Yeah, time. but in Apollo, like by the fourth mission, it was like, oh yeah, they're up there again. It's sad, isn't it? It's such an amazing thing. Rod Pyle, spaceman, thank you. Thank Leo, you, sir. Yeah, always a pleasure. It is the. So I threw you a little bit with the perigee syzygy. Yeah. I, perigee, of course, but syzygy I actually hadn't heard before. Yeah, yeah, that's the, when they're all in alignment. But I guess that happens every full moon is kind of technically a syzygy. So. I guess. That's, that's why you have the chat room, because there's all those... Really they're full of that. They're full of it. They really are. <laughs> yeah. How do you mean that exactly? <laughs> they know all of that stuff. They know yeah. it all. When I was working for the History Channel, every now and then we got mail into the network from people that were... More expert than, than oh, most of us. Oh, inevitably. Are. Oh, I get those emails and, uh, every single day. Yeah. They usually... My favorite one... Yeah. God, stop me if I told you this, but I'd done a World War II doc. I, well, I did a bunch of them because that was big then on a and &E and History right, Channel. Right, And we were, you know, I was showing a B-7, just footage of a B-17 flying over Japan, or uh, over Europe, excuse me. And then, you know, we brought up that inevitable graphic where it, 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 it moves 360 degrees and, you know, list all the stats. Somebody wrote in and said that the tail that the B seventeen I showed showed was a B seventeen E, and the one in the graph was a B seventeen G because the, <laughs> literally the rivet count was wrong. <laughs> he so counted he the rivets. Counters. He counted the rivets on still frame because you could do that in VHS. <laughs> wow! Wow! God bless him. You know, at least you know somebody's paying attention. Yeah. That's kind of so cool. Kinda like a good review. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And we didn't get a chance, but uh, Virgin Galactic had their uh, latest test flight. and They've only got a handful more to go. They're hoping to start carrying passengers in 2022. So I'll expect to see you on that flight. I'll be there. How much do, is a ticket? Uh, they're saying probably about 250 grand. Oh, nothing. Nothing. So it's a rounding error for you. Yeah, yeah. just a <laughs> I'll put that. That's in my travel budget already. No problem. I'll, tra I'll trade in my Jaguar plus about two hundred forty-nine. <laughs> Ron, have a have a great week. And now, are, are you repositioning? Is this a repositioning cruise? What's going on here? No, this is just vacation. First one about five years, so I'll be back at home base next. Oh, week. nice. We'll Where are you? Zoom. I am in Ventura at the Crown Plaza on the beach, and it's oh, nice. 65 degrees. And oh, well, have a wonderful, it's nice to get a little vacation, a little time off. It is, even yeah. if it's just a couple hours away. It's, oh, you know what? That's how That's how you start, right? You slowly get a little farther, a little farther, a little farther each time. Well, and it's, it, there's no stress because you hop in the car and drive. I know, <laughs> I know, yeah. But I do want to get back to Hawaii, that's. Good. I'm so I'm dying for it. Like uh, I know. We're excited. Hey, thanks. Right. Thanks for joining us. Enjoy the rest, even on your vacation. Enjoy the rest of your day. Great pleasure. Take care. Take care. Bye bye. The syzygy perigee, or the perigee syzygy, or this. Which do you which do you like calling the this full moon on Wednesday? The super blood flower moon, super the blood flower super moon, or the syzygy perigee? I think it say something about you. <laughs> Which one you prefer? Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Last segment of the show before we wrap things up for the weekend. Bob is on the line. Our next caller from Tulsa, Oklahoma. Hello, Bob. Hello, Leo. How are you doing? I am well. How are you? Doing great. I was listening, and listening to Rod, uh, I'm kind of a um, solar eclipse snob now that I've seen two. And I don't even pay attention to lunar eclipses. Isn't it funny? I, that's what we were talking about with Rob. Is how, as amazing as these things are, one gets in your doom. It's just part of you know, humans. I think that's really an evolutionary skill. That once you kind of know what that disturbance is, and it's not dangerous, you you tune it out. Yeah, it, there's a, another solar eclipse coming up in a few years. That's coming across uh, Texas and Arkansas. Oh, fun! A lot of people. A lot of people can see it. You're going to chase it or no? Oh, yeah, I'm in Oklahoma, so it might be a four-hour drive. Yeah, we went all the way to Australia to see one about 10 years ago. Uh, that's, I think I've seen a couple, but I think that's the one that, that stuck with me because I was on a boat. Oh, yeah. It is something to see. It's quite an experience. Oh, yeah. Well, Leo, I've uh, been following you since Screensavers and Call for Help, um, and I really appreciate the help you give. Thank and you. Uh, right, right now, uh, help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi, you're my only hope. Uh-oh. <laughs> What's the matter? 
Well, I'm trying to. I've got okay. I'm a CD guy, DVD guy. I always will do that. I I burn the CDs onto my uh, media player, my Windows PC. I've got all this music in there. I've got an iPhone 12 Pro, and I can't figure out how to get them from the media player to the iPhone. I need your help. Do you have, have you put iTunes on your Windows PC yet? Not that I... Y yeah. Okay, because I don't recommend, I don't love it, I don't recommend it. Apple's really, you know, it's a... Yeah. It's kind of a, a it, redhead it, stepchild or whatever that is they call it. But in fact, that's how you do it. Um yeah, it's changed, but it sh you still can't. Is it? Is it changed to the point you can't use it to transfer files anymore? Well, I'm not exactly sure how to. Uh, oh, let me let me tell you what what you what it used to do, and then you see if it works. Because because uh, uh, the trick is to figure out where Windows Media Player is storing your files. You probably know where your music library is, right? It's in Windows Media Player, is all I know. Ah, okay. But there is, yes, yeah, so there's, this is step one, is to figure out where on the hard drive that is. And you can do that in the file menu. There's a manage libraries command and media player that will, that you can see where the, where it's getting its library, music library from on the hard drive. You need to know where, you know, C, users, Bob, music, whatever it is, you need to find out where that is. Okay. Okay. Ideally, it's probably in the music folder, and I'm hoping it is. But ideally, it's you'd, you'd like to get everything in one spot, because then in iTunes, there is a way to add a folder to your iTunes library. And there's two ways you can do that in iTunes. One, you can move things over into the iTunes library. You do not want to do that, because that'll make a duplicate. So you're going to also have to go into iTunes settings and say, let me manage my music. Don't have, don't move my music around. But you can still, without moving the music out of the folder it's in, you can still add it to the iTunes library. And that's the next step. So first find the music, then add that folder or folders to your iTunes library, making sure you've changed your import settings so it doesn't move them. Now, once you've done that, you should be able to connect the phone up using a USB cable. There is one extra little complication. It's not a problem if you're storing those as MP3 files or AAC files. But if they're stored as Windows Media files, you may have to convert them into MP3 first. I saw that once online. I tried to do it, and I ended up with all this duplication. Yeah. I don't know what w WMA, MP3. I, I don't, yeah, it will duplicate it because so you've got a WMA file. Your converter will convert it to MP3. Now you'll have two files, one WMA and one MP3. So I'm going to suggest the chat room saying, Leo, you're telling them the hard way. It's the normal way <laughs> because you need iTunes. But there is a third-party program that is a lot easier. I actually use it on the Mac. It also is available for Windows. It's called iMazing. And it will also do this in a much easier way. Now, it's not cheap. It's 50 bucks. Whoa! <laughs> Come well, on, I've man. <laughs> now, I've kind of invested in the CDs. I might as well do that. Yeah, it's 50 bucks. There's other programs that'll do this. Ecamm has a program called PhoneView, but iMazing is actually pretty good because it, it also is a great way to back up your iPhone. It's a better way to back up your iPhone. It kind of replaces that funky iTunes that, especially on Windows, iTunes is kind of a terrible thing because Apple doesn't like yeah. Windows. Yeah, I was just looking on my computer and uh, the music is, is, it says this PC slash in the music. <laughs> well, you're going to somehow, I can't help you with that, but you're going to have to find that music because you can't do anything with it if it's just, you know, it's, it's, so this is another thing that bothers me a little bit about Windows. They're trying to hide the complicate complexity of a file system from you. So everything's in a library, but but really, it is actually, a f there are files on your hard drive, and you need to know where those files are in order to get them anywhere else. So, Well, I think I can I get somebody else to help me with that and not take up all the time here. I just wanted to make sure I was going down the right path. Yeah, so you basically got to find those things. They'll be, I'm almost certain, 
unless you've put them somewhere else, they're in the music folder. You know, in you know my music. It used to be called my music. Now it's just music. So in right. the in the music folder. And you could right-click on one of them and you could say, show this file, and it'll show it in the Explorer and you'll see what the exact, you know, C colon backslash home backslash Bob backslash music. You'll see the exact location of it. You do need to know where that is in order for either for iTunes or, I, uh, or iMazing to, to get those files. You have to point it at those files. iMazing will let you just copy them right to the iPhone. It's, it's probably the easiest way to do it. Uh, if you don't want to spend anything, iTunes will do it. If you don't mind spending 50 bucks, iMazing will do it. There are other programs as well. Uh, somebody's suggesting this is not a bad idea. Once you get this into iTunes for 25 bucks a year, Apple still sells uh, iTunes Match, which basically replaces all the files with high quality uncopy protected AACs. That's, by the way, another monkey wrench. If you bought, did you buy those? You said you had CDs. You ripped them from CDs. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If you bought them from, from uh, Microsoft, they may still have copy protection on them which you'd have to strip out. But if you rip them from CDs, there's no copy protection. I just got them from uh, music stores, Amazon, wherever. Oh, wow. You mean you could go into a, a store and buy music? Isn't that amazing? Wow. That must have been interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I remember my son, who's now 26, when he was about 15, I said, we got to go over to the record store. And he said, what's a record? What are you talking about, Dad? <laughs> That's when I knew. Times are about to change. Yeah. yeah. It, 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 uh, Apple, I, I'm really sorry to say, just really wants you to be all Apple. And their solutions with other systems are far from ideal. Oh, boy. But you can do it. You're always helpful. And uh, don't forget about that uh, eclipse in a few years. Um, I'm going to come down to Oklahoma and watch it. Okay. How about it? I've always wanted to visit. Sounds good, Leo. Thanks okay. Again, Thanks, Bob. Have a have a wonderful, wonderful day. Take care. Right. Thank you so much, Professor Laura, our musical director, Kim Schaffer, our phone angel. Thanks to you for listening. I'm Leo Laporte, your tech guy. Have a great Geek Week. Well, that's it for the Tech Guy Show for today. Thank you so much for being here. And don't forget, TWIT, T-W-I-T. It stands for This Week in Tech, and you'll find it at twit.tv, including the podcasts for this show. We talk about Windows on Windows Weekly, Macintosh on Mac Break Weekly, iPads, iPhones, Apple Watches on iOS Today, Security and Security Now. I mean, I can go on and on and on. And, of course, the big show every Sunday afternoon, This Week in Tech. You'll find it all at twit.tv. And I'll be back next week with another great Tech Guys show. Thanks for joining me. We'll see you next time.